Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel, I'm Rob and I hope you're having a wonderful day today. Today we continue with the compilation videos which are aimed at people who are working or people who are driving or people who just have a heck of a lot of time and want something on in the background. Please check out the KCC Discord linked in the description down below. There you can talk to me and a whole bunch of KCC fans who hang out there on a regular basis. I look forward to seeing you there. Today we're jumping into some pro revenge. Our first story today comes to us from Shell Loser 42. Stealing my girlfriend's Wi-Fi strained or ended their relationship. Let's jump right in. Backstory. After my girlfriend moved to her new apartment closer to both her sister and myself, she obviously wanted internet. Although she isn't fully tech savvy, she does know her basics and thus explicitly asked the provider if she should be worried about admin admin kind of Wi-Fi protection. She was assured that it was all fully safe out of the box, no admin slash admin. In fact, just press a button to connect her laptop and her Wi-Fi network would be fully secured. The Incident So a few months or years later, my girlfriend started to notice that her internet speed went down. This became very apparent while video chatting with some of her family members in Japan. Like I said, my girlfriend knows her basics, so she knew that it didn't have to be the internet connection itself, it could also be her laptop, or maybe the network cables had eroded due to age. She decided to cover as many options as possible before contacting her ISP support desk. So she asked me to help. I'm a geek and I worked within the field of ICT for over 30 years now, mostly as systems administrator, but also as IT manager or co-manager, during which I'd still try to keep taps with my colleagues and even cover shifts if the need arose. So visiting my girlfriend and getting to show off my elite IT skills, eh. It took me a moment, but I discovered the issue. Someone was leeching off her Wi-Fi. Technically, the ISP support staff were right. This wasn't an admin admin kind of thing anymore. It was completely randomized, sorta. You see, on their routers, the Wi-Fi password was the same as the random SSID, AKA the network name, what the F? I was quite angry at both this incompetence as well as the blatant disrespect for my girlfriend's privacy. Maybe a bit too much, but yeah. Sure, for some people this is only about getting internet, but what many people overlook is that such leechers also gain access to your private network. So basically they could access any public windows or Mac shares you may have active, not to mention any other connected devices. Fortunately, my girlfriend knew her basics, as I mentioned earlier, but I was still angry. The Revenge So I suggested something I had done earlier. Let's replace this POS router for a professional device. In specific, the same kind of Zycel router that I used at my home so that we could set up a secured VPN between ourselves and get some other nice features as well, like a private VoIP connection. She agreed, so we bought her a new router together. We're talking professional gear here. These things cost about as much as a high-end smartphone, so obviously we were going to split the cost, considering that a mid-level could also have helped her out. Now, even though I consider her previous router a POS, I still have to admit that it did provide some very useful features, like a syslog service. It could also use USB storage, so... I turned on Wi-Fi logging, plugged in a large USB memory stick, and then we waited for the new router to arrive. Then I got to work. First, I set up my girlfriend with a nice hidden Wi-Fi network so that no one could easily find it. Next, we set up a much better security scheme, and then it was time to get even with the lowlifes. I set up a second Wi-Fi network, which was completely the same as the previous one, but this time I throttled it down a bit so that it couldn't usurp the full bandwidth. Then I added some specific DNS overrides. DNS is a service on the internet which translates names into IP addresses, which is what your computer needs to connect to something. You may care about reddit.com. All your PC cares about are the associated IP addresses. Thing is, this service can be easily overridden, and I have studied the logs, so I knew exactly what sites the lowlives visited the most. So from now on, going to banka.nl using this router would point your browser to a hardcore, not very legal, gay adult material website. Not very legal as in, the site didn't bother asking for consent first, but got you some close-up screenshots right away. Then it was time for bankb.nl. I redirected that one to a shady hot scissors lesbian website. 
I also noticed that a certain web shop was sporadically used by the leechers, so I decided to redirect that one to a relationship counseling website. When you think your spouse is cheating on you, come to us. It was around that time when I noticed that my girlfriend's router was using more modern firmware than I had on my router. This one also provided web redirection services. Companies can use this to redirect specific websites based on their URL to a local or remote web page. So say you don't want your staff to use social media, then you could just tell the router to redirect, say, Facebook.com to a local web page which explained the no social media allowed policy. Much to my delight, this service also supported a randomized trigger. See, I still remembered a website from the early days of the internet, something about a goat from Sweden, which was so horrible that it became a meme on its own. Seriously, a look at that picture could never be undone anymore. There's a reason I still remember the horror now an easy 30 years later. So I looked for and found a replacement and then happily added that to the randomized redirection service. So every once in a while the leechers would open their favorite websites and no matter whatever kind of site they asked for, they'd always end up with something completely and utterly disgusting on their screen. Then we waited. I need to point out that my girlfriend did not fully agree with some of my actions, especially when she learned of the aftermath, but we never had an argument over this because she could also understand my point of view, don't mess with my girlfriend. And she agrees that if you trespass, even in the digital world, then all bets are off and you lost your rights to a civil solution. Don't mess with a geek, okay? The aftermath. One day, my girlfriend got home from work and noticed a huge moving van outside. She gave it no further mind, but when she got to her front door, she noticed that her neighbor two doors over was moving out. She brought this up with her direct in-between neighbor a few days later. And as it turns out, things completely exploded over there. The shouting and accusations could even be heard through the walls. Seems the pair got into huge arguments about their rather explicit choice of websites. And once the deed was done, there was no room left for any kind of reasoning. One of the two even accused the other for hacking the internet because it was only after the first fallout that those goading pictures started to show up. As far as we know, they broke up. For the record, I regret nothing. I did remove the SSID for obvious reasons and also reset the DNS and forwarding sections and now things are back to normal. More importantly, my girlfriend is still very happy with the router and the extra services to this very same day of writing. She's working her way up as a 3D artist and the knowledge that all her work will be fully kept safe after she copies her projects onto my NAS is a deal breaker for her. Seriously you guys, always remember that when you use someone else's internet connection, this includes free services, then you're fully relying on their goodwill. Such services could be easily abused as well, either through pranking like I did or worse. How about I redirect your bank request to a fake login page so that I can store and or abuse your data? Thanks for reading. Well, this is an interesting one because you have to be a special kind of stupid to not realize that somebody's screwing around with you when your bank site goes to adult material, especially if you're knowingly leeching internet service off of somebody else that you're not paying for. Do me a quick favor and take a look down below the video. If that subscribe button's still red, it means you're actually not subscribed to the KCC channel. Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. Our next story today comes to us from Chuck It Bucket. So I recently had a run-in with UPS. Let's jump right in. I posted this to Petty Revenge, but it got removed and I was told to post it here. Enjoy. UPS smashed a nearly new MacBook that I sent with them. I asked them nicely to pay me back for it and they arsed about, blaming me, blaming my packaging, saying it was impossible they damaged it, etc. I was able to prove my packaging was flawless and get a statement from the Apple shop that I took it to to say that it was damaged caused by being dropped or thrown. I could also prove it worked when I sent it. They weren't interested and messed me about for weeks, sending me from pillar to post, even threatening to make me pay interest on custom charges which I wasn't liable for as the laptop was smashed on arrival and thus worthless at import. I took it to small claims. They hired a lawyer who sent me letters stating they contested it and would go for full fees etc if I lost. I went for it anyway. 
I did law stuff at university, so I knew the basics and I thought my case was pretty clear cut. I won. I won my cost back plus extra plus interest. They ignored the court order and did not pay. Now, this laptop was originally being sent to my beloved mother-in-law. She asked me to help her with the problem as UPS was also seriously harassing her for the customs fees. However, very unexpectedly, before I could resolve it, she passed away. It was the last thing she ever asked me to do for her. I love that woman more than pretty much any human on this planet. She was my mother, my best friend, and my mentor. Taking down UPS was now my personal vendetta. I researched my options. I could have taken the usual, more conservative legal routes to reclaim my money, but no, F them. I don't care about the money anymore. I want revenge. I want drama. I want karmic justice. I went to the high court. I got a writ of control. I, of course, added on more fees and more interest. I then hired the most aggressive bailiff firm in London. I trusted that the crappy processes and attitude of UPS to mean that they would ignore the letters and actually get a visit. They did. The bailiffs rock up at UPS headquarters and explain the situation. UPS refuses to pay, so the bailiffs start listing goods. Security tries to make them leave. The office manager tries to bully them out. Obviously, no craps are given by the bailiffs, and they crack on with their jobs. I wasn't allowed the body cam footage, but they did send me a detailed report. The final conclusion is copied from it below. Calls were then made to the accounts manager who arrived in a hurry. As no payment was forthcoming from them, the agent again explained the removal process and cost involved and called the office for approval to begin removals. The agent began to seize assets. The finance director then arrived on the scene. He was not at all happy about the attendance, but ultimately agreed to pay a voluntary payment in full from his personal account in order to stop the removal. I know it's a drop in the ocean to UPS, but I got more than double what I originally asked for to replace the laptop. They would have had to pay even more on top in fees to the bailiffs. I reckon it cost them at least three times more than the original claim in the end, but mostly, I just enjoy the mental image of the flustered finance director and his impotent rage having to pay his own money to stop the heavies from taking the desktop computers and fancy pot plants and things out of their swanky head office lobby. Well, OP, I honestly think if your package had been sent in an explosion-proof container, they still would have tried to say that it was a problem with the packaging. I think a lot of companies just bank on customers really not knowing what to do in this situation or not having the means to take the big company to court. Our next story today comes to us from Jamshack. Don't F with the valets. Let's jump right in. For some backstory, I worked as a valet in a small coastal city in college, and the restaurants I worked for were very popular for both locals and tourists. We'd generally be busy year-round, but as the restaurants are both waterfront, spring, summer, and early fall are our peak seasons per se. The downside to these restaurants is that parking can be a huge pain in the butt. Combined, the restaurants can seat around 400 people at any given time, and can usually turn over about 2,500 seats on a busy weekend. But the parking lot can only hold about 60 to 70 cars at a time, which isn't much at all. That's why I, the valet, am there. We have about 25 to 30 designated valet spots, used to have double that amount, but I digress, and are really good about utilizing all of them efficiently so we can park as many cars as possible, thus getting as many tips as possible. Being that the valet spots are kind of in a weird spot but really close to the restaurants and our stand, and there aren't any signs that say valet only, we usually show up a bit early and cone the spots off so people know they aren't for self-parking. Now, most people see the cones and recognize those spots are pretty clearly not available. But some people are so dumb and such buttholes that they will move the cones and park in our spots anyway. Disclaimer, there is a parking garage for overflow parking, but people don't particularly like using it. People do this pretty regularly and we're usually pretty cool about it. One of the valets will normally just walk up to them as they're parking and tell them that the spot is reserved for valet and they'll usually comply. Obviously, this was not the case yesterday, or I wouldn't be writing this right now. While we were in full swing last night, some douchebag is not 100 feet from me moving a cone, so he can try to sneakily take one of our spots. 
I was talking to a customer, so I wasn't able to immediately go tell him not to park there. After finishing up talking, I went over to Douche as he was getting out of his car, and immediately, I knew I had encountered this exact guy trying to do this crap before. After this encounter, I knew revenge was going to be necessary. Our conversation went as follows. Hey man, I'm sorry, but these spots are for valet only. That's why we have the cone set up. If you'd like to self-park, you can park in this main lot, pointing to the full lot, or in the parking garage. But there's nowhere to effing park in that lot, and I don't want to park in the parking garage. You guys always do this crap to me. So if I valeted, I could just park here? That's BS, bro. I'm parking here whether you like it or not. I was pretty taken aback and basically just walked away, not wanting to get into a fight over a parking spot. I knew it was time this guy learned his lesson. Now, I don't have the authority to tow his car or give him a boot, and I wouldn't anyways because I'm not a butthole, but my power is in pure number of cars I have access to. Luckily, he did this at about 8pm. I contractually only have to be there until 10pm, at which time I can park the remaining cars in certain places, and then leave the keys with the bartenders inside. Most nights I would stay to get the tips, but tonight I was dropping keys. Conveniently, Douche had parked in the area where we moved cars to before we dropped the keys. My plan, use the valeted cars to block Douche in, and then leave him with having no way of leaving until the cars around him left. There was one car that would be particularly important, the one directly in front of him. I had a special car for that spot, it was owned by a restaurant employee that I knew wouldn't be off until 2 a.m. Perfect. I maneuvered all the cars around him in a way that didn't make me look like I was intentionally blocking him, but in a way that made it look like I had no other choice. Everything fell into place perfectly, and I could already feel a justice chub starting to form. I went inside to drop the keys and explain to the restaurant manager what happened and my revenge. She loves us and said she'd 100% have our backs, which I figured she would. I told her to text me and tell me how everything played out. This is the text I received last night around 11pm. The guy just came up to me pissed. He said there was a car blocking him from leaving and that it needed to be moved immediately so he could leave. I tried to explain that you guys have to put cars there before you leave and that you even told him not to park there. I guess that made him mad so he started raising his voice at me bar manager saw and told me that he had been drinking for a while, which I assumed from the beginning. I told him that I couldn't, for liability reasons, allow him to drive home since he had been drinking. He got really pissed because he lives 40 minutes drive away, but ended up taking an expensive Uber home. She told me she slipped in the argument that he was going to get another ride, whether he liked it or not. Gotta be honest OP, I think in this case you might have actually saved a life that night. Because every time you stop a drunk driver from getting behind the wheel, you risk saving a family from tragedy. Our next story today comes to us from Lil Devil. How Mrs. Reliable got her douchebag of a boss fired. Let's jump right in. Hey everyone, long time lurker on this subreddit, first time posting, and boy do I have a story. So letting everyone know that it's going to be a long post, just letting everyone know ahead of time. Background. I've been working the retail business for over 20 years and let me tell you, some of the managers they hire, I can do a better job. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Over the years of doing retail, I have established a reputation for myself. I'm Mrs. Reliable. Need someone to come in? They call me. Need someone to stay late? They call me. Need to switch with someone because management said no for your day off? They call me. Need to switch with someone because of a last minute plan? They call me. You can probably see where this story might be going, right? This story takes place a couple of years ago when I worked a major grocery store in my town and city as a cashier. The story. This has taken place a couple of years back in 2020. I'm on my two years at this store and we went through so many people and managers it wasn't funny. Literally, it felt like we had a revolving door with how much turnover in employment we had. Getting back to the story, I was a cashier, and the thing about me doing the job is that I have a tendency to be too good at my job. I was just hired to be a cashier. I was not a manager, nor a monitor, someone that is a step down from management, but doesn't have all the responsibilities of management. Nor was I customer service. 
However, I was trained for nearly all the duties of someone who is. Need change? I went to the cashier, got the money out of the drawer, and went to grab the change that they needed. Need an override? I came over to see what the problem is and did the override. Need something from behind the counter? I just need to know what it is you need and I went and grabbed it. I did all this on top of my cashier duties and self-checkout duties. Then, douchebag came along. My manager at the time, let's call her Ashley. Ashley is the front end manager, meaning she's in charge of everything that goes on at the registers, cash office, where all the money is, customer service, and the self-checkouts. Now, I liked Ashley. She was a really good boss and I liked working with her. Ashley had gotten pregnant and was expecting her second child. I was excited for her. Unfortunately, when Ashley came back though, she was no longer going to be a manager, nor was she going to be full-time. She decided to come back as part-time. I can't really blame her though. You're working 40 hours a week and are not allowed any overtime whatsoever. Plus, you can be working as early as 5 a.m. to working as late as whenever the last customer decides to leave. Last time that happened when I didn't get out until 11.15 p.m. Enter douchebag. If you ever wonder what happened to that spoiled brat in school whose mommy never said no and always got what they always wanted, that's a douchebag all grown up in a manager's position. Douchebag was the type of manager that if he told you to do something, he expected you to do it without any questions. Have plans after work? Douchebag expected you to whip out your phone right then and there, cancel your plans, and come into work. Have a doctor's appointment? Douchebag expected you to cancel that appointment and then come into work. If you told him no, he would say in the most condescending tone, well, I need you to do it anyway, and then just stand there scowling out at you the whole time. Basically trying to intimidate you by making you feel so uncomfortable by staring until you cave. The setup. Now, I had my fair share of awful managers, to the point where if I didn't need the money, I would have walked out right then and there and never returned. And I had my fair share of good managers. Douchebag was somewhere in the middle, leaning more towards the walking out. Now, with me, I'll admit, over the years, I developed a sassy, sarcastic personality. I'm blunt, no filter, say what's on my mind, and I don't put up with people's BS. Apparently, Douchebag never got the memo of my not taking people's BS. Around this time, summer was ending, meaning we were in the now hiring stage, and many positions were starting to open up in the store. Keep this in mind, what Douchebag did to get me to start my pro revenge? Strike one. I had outpatient vein surgery done on one of my legs and needed to take a few days off. Since I had some vacation time saved up, I used my hours for those few days that I didn't have to worry so much about not getting paid. Douchebag called me a day before I was supposed to come in, asking if I can do a 9 to 1. I asked him three times over the phone, who's closing? Because originally, I was supposed to close that day until I got my approval for my days off. Douchebag never answered me, so I just figured they had it covered. I came in, and of course, halfway through my shift, Douchebag calls me over and says that they don't have a closer. Keep in mind that I asked him three times over the phone who was closing. Douchebag wanted me to clock out to go home for a few hours and then come to work and close. I said no, and then he tried the whole guilt tripping about not having anyone, and that we really need you to do this. I said no because one, I'm really tired and just came off surgery like three days ago. Two, I already made plans with my husband for the evening. Of course, Douchebag didn't like this because the next time I came to work, Douchebag was just being petty and passive aggressive with me. Basically, he would pretend I wasn't there, ignored me, or the transaction that he was doing was taking longer than it should, and then chastise me in front of the customers for taking too long to get to him. When I had my follow-up appointment with the vein doctor, Douchebag asked me if I can come in earlier. I told him no, I can't, because I have a doctor's appointment in the morning that day. Then he did his usual, we need you to do it anyway, and started doing that stare with me. Unfortunately for him, I'm used to this when it came to Karens and Kevins trying to intimidate me because something didn't come right. I quickly shut that down by getting the other cashier's attentions when they need help with something or quickly grabbed a customer's attention. When I came in after my appointment, douchebag with a smug grin, very loudly, in earshot of the big wigs from corporate visiting that day. Well, OP, looks like you noticed that I didn't call you in because we didn't need you. 
I replied, good, because I wasn't able to come in early anyway. Strike two. Remember how I said that the store had openings? Well, turns out customer service needed some help, and the only way to get there was to ask your manager. So I went to Douchebag and asked about being at the customer service desk. With everything that I've already been doing, I was basically the front end assistant manager without the pay and title. Douchebag said that he would get back to me, especially since I've been doing a great job. Two to three weeks later, I'm seeing people that I trained or have started months after I did getting promoted to customer service desk while I stayed as a cashier with all the other responsibilities piled on top. The customer service desk position would have easily been a 50 cent raise. The monitor position would have been a 75 cent raise. And of course, Douchebag didn't want to pay more for me doing the exact same thing that I was already doing. I was starting to get the message of, why pay for the cow when the milk is free? Strike three. I was starting to look for another job at this point because I was getting sick and tired of how I was being treated, but I wanted to try and give this guy one last chance. So I found out that the seafood department in my store had an opening, and I even talked to the seafood department manager, Debbie, about me possibly being in her department. She was ecstatic to have me and was willing to work around my college schedule. I had to talk to manager Douchebag in order to get the transfer going. I talked to Douchebag and he started to come up with any and all kinds of excuses to not have me transfer. I quickly shot that down and even the one where he tried to say that I can't because another co-worker was transferring. First time I heard of this. But the co-worker said they had no problem with me going, so I thought that was that. Right? Wrong. Three to four weeks have passed and I've been getting nowhere with the whole transferring to the other department. Even Debbie was wondering why it was taking so long to get to the seafood department and why management was dragging their feet with this. Turns out, Douchebag blocked my transfer and they wound up hiring a new employee to the seafood department. Douchebag thought that if there was no positions available, he can just deny my transfer that I have no choice but to stay. After an argument between the two of us about this, because I was calling him out on his BS, Douchebag said the magic words, just do your job. Cue the malicious compliance. Just do my job? Okay. I was so glad that the wearing a mask was required, otherwise, Douchebag might have seen my evil smile when I agreed to just do my job. Need an override? Sorry, but I'm not management, nor am I a monitor, so I can't do that. Let me go grab someone who can. Need change? Sorry, but I'm not management, nor am I a monitor, so I can't do that. Let me go grab someone who can. Need something behind the customer service desk? Sorry, but I'm not trained, nor am I customer service. Let me grab someone who can get that for you. Douchebag was at his wit's end and even tried to write me up for something. I quickly shut that down when I started to recite what being a cashier entails and what my actual job of being a cashier is. And I told him that if he wants me to continue with all those responsibilities, that he needs to promote me so I can do all those responsibilities. He quickly stepped back into his passive aggressive behavior that I quickly shut down. I eventually found another job with a better pay and better benefits and handed in my resignation of me leaving in 10 days. That douchebag tried to deny and say, no, you have to give us two weeks notice. I quickly shut that down with a response. You wouldn't be giving us two weeks notice if you're going to fire us or lay us off or let go. Just a two minute warning. Cue the petty revenge. Now you're probably wondering what could I have possibly done for the petty revenge, right? Well, there was an old saying, never kill the golden goose. Well, readers, what do you think happens to a department that is solely dependable on one person whose reputation is Mrs. Reliable? Need me to come in on my day off? Sorry, I can't. I have plans. Need me to stay late? Sorry, I can't. I already made plans. Someone called out? Sorry, I can't make it. I did this throughout my entire rest of my stay at that place. Douchebag couldn't do anything about either, and it was starting to get to him on what happens when you rely heavily on someone else, but treat them so badly that they actually decide to leave. Douchebag's performance, because I wasn't there to cover his butt, was starting to take a toll. He had to do so much now of his own responsibilities, and there wasn't a thing he could do to me. He kept trying to be extra passive aggressive with me, to which I just smiled and waved and said goodbye to everyone but him. Now, this wouldn't be a pro-revenge without the pro-revenge. After talking to a friend of mine about what happened when I worked there, 
He told me to report this to the district manager, because that kind of behavior isn't good for the workplace. Cue the pro revenge. I got the email address of the district manager from my friend, and then I went back to the store as a customer. I kept in touch with a couple of my old coworkers and kept asking them how they were doing and how's work going. None of them had a problem inventing to me on how bad things were getting with Douchebag. I asked if they didn't mind if I put their name in the complaint or if they just wanted to be anonymous. A lot of them chose the latter. I whipped out my phone, used the quick memo app that I had, and quickly wrote the notes in my phone, the date and the register that the cashier was on at the time. I sent that email with the attached notes and with the entire account on my part as well to the district manager. Now, this wouldn't be a pro revenge if it just stopped there. I took it a step further. You see, with the receipts that we get, there is a survey on the bottom of every receipt and management kept trying to boost us to get the customers to take the survey because it helped with the storefront and all the points that the store gets. Well, here's the thing about that survey. When you fill out the survey, including the comments, everyone gets to see it. And I mean everyone. I mean everyone. Douchebag, the assistant store manager, the store manager, the regional manager, the district manager, and the representative of corporate gets to see it all. So you can imagine what I did. Needed a snack for school? Filled out the survey. Needed groceries? Filled out the survey. Needed a drink? Filled out the survey. I went to that store multiple times and gotten so many different surveys because there wasn't a limit for how many you can fill out. And I made sure to put everything that Douchebag was doing on all those surveys, including how he treated his employees. Three months after I left, the person they hired back in Seafood to make sure I couldn't go back there quit. Six months after I left, Douchebag was nowhere to be found. A new manager took over for him, and no one seems to know what happened to Douchebag. I think one thing we need to do to protect ourselves in situations is to only do the job that we're paid to do. Now, you can show them that you know how to do the other jobs by doing them maybe for a couple of weeks, but don't continue to do that job if you're not getting the pay for that job. Now, in the comments down below this, there was a little bit of a debate because OP's been a cashier for over 20 years and doing the jobs of management, quote unquote. There's a lot of people in the comments saying that OP got walked all over for 20 years and they weren't promoted up because, well, they were doing that job anyway. I'd love to see what you guys think down below though. Some people said that OP might have been a little bit full of themselves, saying that they did everything that the manager did, which they probably didn't. But anyway, I'd love to know what you guys think. Comment down below. This next story comes to us from Anon Can't Quit. You're replaceable. Okay, bye. Let's jump right in. I worked for a company for just under five years. The company I worked for existed for an additional 10 years prior to me. While I worked at this company, it ballooned to be the number one provider in the region for its unique service with about 75% of the market. It was a small business of about 15 employees. I loved my job and the skills I learned while working there were quite valuable. I loved my team and the clients we provided services for. My twice yearly reviews with the owner were always 10 out of 10 with no recommendations for improvement. I was exceptional at my job in every way. I handled company operations, HR and payroll, customer service, marketing, employee management, schedules, employee and client training, and many other things at this company. I was also able to step in and do any of my teammates' jobs if they were out sick or on vacation. The owner of the company was giving out a bonus late summer last year and mine, while being more than previous years, was noticeably less than my teammates. I asked owner, are the bonuses related to performance? And if so, what could I have done to earn more? Owner replied, the bonuses are not performance related, you're just more replaceable than others. Oh, okay, I replied, and proceeded to process each of the bonuses, then went to lunch. I called my spouse to gain wisdom and advice. I was pretty lit, but didn't want to make a rash decision. My spouse is very intelligent, and while they are not a fortune teller, they have an ability to foresee various responses and all the potential outcomes. They are business-wise, and have been on the executive team of a large company for the past 21 years, while also serving on several community boards and business advisory boards. We decided together to continue forward with our scheduled vacation and use the time away to calm our minds relax, have fun, 
and to also determine the best course of action for me. We were leaving after working one more day, so I worked like all was normal the rest of the day and the following day, then left on vacation. While away, we discussed several scenarios, the potential outcomes, consulted with a business advisor and a business attorney. With all the advice I received, I determined that upon my return from vacation, I would resign from my role with a two-week notice. However, in a fit of rage, I was immediately terminated by the owner, which was one of the scenarios we thought would happen, so I was prepared for owner's poor reaction. During the next couple of weeks, I created and opened a competing business offering similar services. However, I offered more customizable options with higher quality service and results. I knew our clients wanted these options and had proposed said options several times at Old Workplace, but was never green-lighted to implement the changes for no reason other than owner didn't come up with the idea, so it was a stupid idea. I also maintained communications with a few people from my old team. My old team did not relay the day-to-day -day happenings at my previous workplace, and I never asked about the company. However, they would vent to me on occasion. I would listen without comment. I knew service, quality, and the work environment in general suffered since my departure. Morale went down and clients were less satisfied. I also read the Google and Facebook reviews for old company. Yikes. Additionally, two full-time and one part-time persons were hired to fill my role, and a portion of my responsibilities, like HR and payroll, were filled by outside companies. I quickly built up my business, and within three months, was able to hire several of my old teammates. They were able to jump in on day one with minimal training, as they were the best employees at my old workplace. The quality of my previous workplace's offerings continued to fall, which sent additional business my way, and quickly caused incoming work to be non-existent at that old workplace. My old workplace went from being the number one provider of unique service in the region to nothing in a matter of months. My previous employer is now searching for gainful employment. I know this because over the weekend, owner applied for a position at my spouse's company. Side note, I think my spouse's company should bring my previous employer in for an interview, but when they arrive, surprise, I'm the interviewer, and all I say is, how replaceable am I now? My spouse, rightfully so, has said no. Moral of the story, don't tell your employees they are replaceable because they might create a competing business that is better than yours, while taking your best employees and your clients, which will leave you with no business to sell. Owner's whole retirement plan was to sell the business, and starting all over by searching for employment under someone else. Looks like your company was replaceable, not me. You have this one person at your work that can do everything. All of the jobs that would normally take a whole bunch of other people to do. In this case, you need to be showering that person with gifts, giving them massive raises, and making sure that they are the happiest person at your company. Because at any time, they can turn, leave, go to another company and do all those jobs there, or as in this case, create their own company and put you out of business with their superior product. Our next story today comes to us from Meltdown. Tried to throw me under the proverbial bus, ran herself over. Let's jump right in. I was building an online training module at work that is intended to teach existing users how to work a new process. It has interactive elements, quizzes, segments to work through a few sample scenarios, etc. Now, we'd recently got a new associate director who, from what I can tell, advanced through the company by throwing other people under the bus. She gets promoted not for her own merits, but because at the end of the day, she had less mud sticking to her than other applicants. It's uncanny to the point that there simply had to be more to it than stupid office politics. I'll get to that in a bit. So after I have the first draft of the module done, it gets sent out for the usual round of testing. And there are, of course, a couple of things that need to be corrected. I build the module off the notes the subject matter experts leave me, and a few things inevitably get lost in translation. But this new associate director just rips it to shreds, complaining that it's completely incomprehensible, needs to go into much greater detail asking questions about nearly every individual mouse click in the sample scenarios, and overall stating that it's impossible to follow. The thing is, this module is intended for our finance department, 
for people who have a background in finance and have already been trained on how to use our internal software. She is a training services associate director with a teaching background. The module isn't supposed to make sense to a former middle school social studies teacher. It's supposed to make sense to people with finance degrees. I push back and try explaining this to her in a million different ways, but she's having none of it. So I have to go back to the subject matter experts with her, 20 pages worth of criticism, and at first they think I'm joking. I had to forward her email before they finally believed me. So for the next two weeks, we're going over every nuance, including readdressing everything that was covered during their three-week classroom training, how to set up their network drive, how to set up Outlook, including things as nuanced as, if you don't know how to set up your email signature, click here. I mean, really basic, basic stuff that has nothing to do with what the module was originally supposed to teach. But I now had to include it all because our new associate director couldn't find the on switch if you stapled her finger to it. This wastes my time, the subject matter expert's time, and time spent re-recording all the voice work. If you've done voice work in the past, you know you never get it in one take. After it's all done, I send it back out for review and approval, and the associate director simply doesn't respond. A week passes. The finance director takes an interest in why this module is almost a month overdue. I go to forward the associate director's email again, except now I can't find it. Odd, seeing as how I have a hoarding problem when it comes to email. I check with one of the subject matter experts I was working with. He can't find it either. Turns out, none of us can find it. It's gone. So I check with a friend of mine in IT who, after a little detective work, discovers that a week ago, someone did a compliance delete on the exchange server. This basically is a seek and destroy for messages meeting certain criteria. In this case, a specific phrase she used in her email. I start digging through Outlook, trying to find particular emails related to this that might be used to defend my actions, and they're all gone. Inbox, sent items, deleted items, every last one of them. Any email containing that particular phrase anywhere in it. This kind of thing is normally used by admins to mass delete spam or phishing emails from all users at once. Except in this case, someone apparently deleted emails that showed evidence of her awful decisions. My friend in IT can smell a juicy story a mile away and was very interested in seeing where this went. She recovered the deleted emails and I promptly saved them to a flash drive. For the next few days, every time I had any email with this associate director's name on it, even unrelated stuff, you never know how something might fit together, I saved a copy to the flash drive. I informed the subject matter experts to do the same and we started building our offline evidence locker. I didn't want to blow the lid on it just yet. I wanted to see if my suspicions were correct. Maybe a lifetime of watching spy movies and cop dramas had corrupted my thinking. Maybe there was another explanation. Who knows? It could happen. I'm not God. I don't know everything. I'll play defense. So after several weeks in total trying to appease this associate director's unquenchable thirst for irrelevant details and then getting ignored for a week, she finally publishes it and sends it to the finance director to approve it so it can go live. Woohoo! Except the module, which was supposed to be a 30-minute online course, now contained three hours of content and went down several irrelevant rabbit holes that had been deemed critical supporting information. As an analogy, imagine designing a training module to teach a nurse how to enter some new CPT codes and being told you have to teach him how to read too because he might not know what words are. That's how much BS was rammed into this thing. And the finance director, of course, hated it and was surprised that such a rambling mess of a module would come from me of all people. So he calls a meeting with me and the associate director on Tuesday to get some answers. And sure enough, she immediately tried to distance herself from it, tried to paint it as she made a couple suggestions, and I clearly went way overboard how I must have sent her a different version that she approved and switched them afterwards. That's not even possible. It would get thrown back into a draft status. She kept trying to talk over me as I voiced my defense, and to his credit, the finance director finally just muted her so I could speak. And boy, did I. I explained everything. 
I shared my screen, popped in my flash drive, and opened my copies of the emails that had supposedly been deleted. Every email exchange where she complained about the material, I pushed back, and she flat out ordered me to build the module in the way I did. She abruptly left the meeting and went offline. The finance director asked if I could send him a copy of all relevant files, and as I did so, I told him they might not be there later, and then explained what I had learned about someone in IT using the compliance delete. He assures me he'll look into it, and the crap immediately hit the fan. The associate director never logged back on. There was a massive internal audit where people from her previous departments were asked to provide statements. Leadership tried to keep it hush-hush, but you just can't keep something that big under wraps. I don't know the specific what's and how's, but the associate director and one of the IT managers had both left the company to pursue the next stage of their careers, and we sincerely wish them the best. I don't really do the social media thing, but over the next few days as the rumor mill did what rumor mills do, I heard their crap absolutely blew up, and it came out that the associate director and that IT manager were having an affair. Now, this all went down about a month ago, but as I write this post, I thought to check online court records. Both are now facing divorces, filed by their respective spouses. So yeah, there's a void in my direct leadership, in IT's leadership, and the entire IT department is getting a shakedown by information security to determine if there were any other leaks. I spent some time reflecting on why this whole series of events happened, and my best guess is she wanted to make a grand entrance by spearheading this masterwork training module that covered every possible scenario and contained any and all information anyone could possibly want. Then, as she started to realize how wasteful, rambling, and unnecessary it was, she realized that her grand entrance would be a grand faceplant. So she tried to erase the evidence and pin all the nonsense on me to save face, but inadvertently set in motion the events that would expose her little arrangement with the IT manager, taking it up the butt in order to cover her butt, I guess. So what I got out of the story was that the finance director and the IT director dug their own graves pretty deep, might I add, and then OP just basically tossed them the rope that they needed to eventually end up in those graves. The one thing that's really eating at me here though is how didn't the IT manager think that they could get these emails back at some point? Because if you're the manager of the IT department, it usually means you're a fairly smart person, but I guess not in this case. This next story comes to us from Viper30,000. Turnabout is always fair play. Let's jump right in. I'm not sure if this one belongs here as I was not the one actually wronged. My revenge was taken for someone I have never met, and I honestly don't know if they personally got any satisfaction from it. I do know what it did to the perpetrator and that it satisfied me, so I'll let the readers decide. Like many of my tales, this one takes place in the distant past, before cell phones were common and before universal caller ID was the norm. In a time dinosaurs most likely roamed the earth, well, the 80s, at least. These things are very important to this story. Our tale takes place on a large west coast city known for a big orange bridge and delicious sourdough bread. I was living in the city for several months working temporary duty for my company and was preparing for work on the day in question. As was my custom, I was getting dressed listening to the morning radio show on a local station. This station's jocks had started doing something called the Monday morning wake up call where on the first day of the week, they would make a prank call on the air to a victim chosen from write-in suggestions from the listening audience. Doing this was actually very controversial in radio circles at the time. I had been a radio DJ in my hometown for a few years, and there are rules you must follow. One of the biggest rules is that you can't make a false or deceptive radio transmission, like announcing an emergency, sending an SOS, or cry for help, or other such deceptions. Doing so is a federal offense. You can lose your license and be fined or even do jail time. It's a big no-no. The debate has long since been decided, but at the time, doing prank calls on the air was a gray area. There were people who were sure it constituted a false transmission, and some stations refused to do it. The argument was still alive at the time this happened. This day happened to be a Monday, and the intended victim had been nominated by her husband, 
they had experienced a power failure at home earlier in the week and the husband's suggestion was that the station call his wife, claimed to be from the utility, and tell her that the power outage was somehow their fault and they would have to pay for it. The station staff loved the idea and they proceeded to call the wife at her place of employment, a local bank. The victim answered and the prank began. Hello, is this Mrs. Victim? I'm John Doe from Area Power Company. Do you remember having a power failure earlier this week? Well, it was due to a blown transformer on your block, and we've determined that the cause is a wiring fault in your house. We may have to cut off your power until you get it fixed. Also, you will be charged for the transformer. The total cost is X thousand dollars. Would you prefer we put that on your utility bill, or do you want to make other arrangements to pay? As you might imagine, the woman was shocked, then scared, as she asked for more information, having trouble believing that they were going to have to pay thousands of dollars. She got increasingly more upset. This egged the radio staff on. The guy making the call kept increasing the pressure on her more and more, eventually telling her that her power would likely be cut off until payment was made, and that there might be a lawsuit. After several minutes, she suddenly hung up in tears. He called her back, and when she heard his voice, she hung up again, crying even harder. This time, the guy waited a minute and then called back again. Another lady answered the phone, a co-worker, and he asked to speak to Mrs. Victim. When the co-worker asked his name, he replied, this is her husband, distinctive first name. The co-worker cursed at him, called him a liar, and hung up. The radio studio was filled with laughter. The jocks thought it was hilarious. They took calls from listeners who were all laughing and talking about what a great prank it was. They finally got the husband on the phone, he of the distinctive name, and he was also laughing and joking that he'd surely be sleeping on the sofa tonight. He was congratulating the radio staff on the fine job they had done terrorizing his wife. The radio host promised the listening audience that, because the prank was so funny, they would certainly be playing the whole recorded prank again at noon. So be sure to be listening and call your friends. I, in my efficiency apartment listening to this, was getting mad. I was still pretty newly married and couldn't imagine doing something like that to my wife. All I could think of while the staff and listeners on the radio were laughing was that, a few miles away, a young woman was in the ladies' room crying, probably with co-workers trying to calm her down. What made it worse to my mind was that the guy who set her up for this was the one guy in the world who should have had her back, her husband. Anger turned to resolve. Resolve formed a plan. I grabbed the city phone book, remember, it's the 80s, and looked up two phone numbers. I called the first one. You may remember that I said I had been a radio disc jockey myself. It was a tiny dawn to dusk station, but I knew how stations worked. I knew what they liked, and more to the point, I knew what they did not like. I also had done a lot of voiceover work and could sound professional as heck. The phone rang and was answered. You've reached K dot 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 radio jerk. I launched my attack. In my professional voice, yes, this is George Smith. I picked a more believable name from the city office of the Federal Communications Commission. I've been getting some disturbing calls about your morning radio show, and I need to speak to your program director to discuss it. Radio guy one is stammering. Uh, he's not, um, here right now. Let me get you someone else. I was put on hold. After a few minutes, Radio Guy 2 also stammering. Hi, um, hello. Uh, this is Radio Guy 2. Um, you're from the FCC? Yes, this is George Smith from the City Office of the Federal Communications Commission. As I told your coworker, I've been getting some disturbing calls about your morning radio show, and I need to speak to your program director to discuss it. Radio Guy 2 had short silence. Uh, he's not in yet. He'll be here at, um, 9 o'clock. Okay, well, I can start with your station manager, since he will need to be in the conversation as well. Radio Guy 2, breathing fast, starting to lose all his composure. Uh, wow, um, he gets in at 9 too. I, um, I can, um, can I have him call you? He half asked and half pleaded. I let out what I hoped was a bureaucratic sounding sigh. Very well, I will expect to hear from him at 9. I will need to speak to your station manager, your programming director, and very likely your on-air personnel from this morning. I'll also need your station logs. Radio Guy 2. Oh, yes sir, I'll make sure he calls you right away. Alright, I'll be expecting his call. Here's my number. At this point, I gave Radio Guy 2 the second number I had looked up in the phone book, 
the main number for the city office of the Federal Communications Commission. Radio Guy 2 stammered his thanks and promises of phone calls and we hung up. I went back to the radio. Jerk disc jockey. Uh, oh, the FCC is calling. Well, they can't do anything to me. I've got a year of pre-law in college and blah, blah, blah. He continued his defiance for a few minutes and then went to commercial. I kept listening. They stopped talking about the prank call. They stopped taking phone calls from listeners. They stopped talking to husband. They started playing music. A lot of music. I listened for the rest of the day. They didn't talk about it the rest of that day, and they didn't replay it at noon. In fact, for the rest of the week I listened and heard nothing about it. I was a bit surprised. I figured that they might stop talking about it for a little while, but not altogether. It wasn't until later that I realized why they went so silent. I had scared them. In my quest to get a little vengeance for that crying woman I'd never met, I scared them. But more to the point, I'd embarrassed them. And jerk disc jockey had helped. Once he went live with his bravado against the call from the feds, their listeners knew they'd been called and heard the silence afterwards too. They were embarrassed because I had just done to them what they had done to her, and they didn't want to have to admit it. I've kept the rather distinctive name of the husband a secret because I've always wished that I could meet that poor woman, and that name would be how I would know it was really her. I doubt she's still married to the guy, but I'd like to let her know that in that place, on that day, someone had her back. OP, you did a wonderful thing for a stranger. That makes you a really good person. Well done. Does anyone remember back in the day there was a prank call that was all over the internet? A lady called into the radio station and asked them to call her boyfriend, and they played that they were from a floral company and he had won free flowers and asked him who he'd want to send them to. And he immediately said, my wife, Cindy. While his girlfriend's sitting there going, your wife? Cindy? What? <laughs> if you haven't heard that one, oh my gosh, look up Radio Prank Flowers. Our next story today comes to us from Word Roll. When someone tried to get you fired, but you have a reverse card. Let's jump right in. This incident blew up in March 2021 in the middle of lockdown and stuff. It would probably be recognizable to people I work with. Hopefully they don't read this thread, haha. <laughs> It's a story about someone whose ambition was bigger than their ethics and the law, and it coming back to bite them. It's a bit long, sorry. At the time, I was working as a manager in a mid-sized business. While I was there, I was assigned a new member to my team. I'll call her Evil. Evil was in her mid-twenties and was pretty fresh out of college. She was the kind of person who could talk your ear off about all of her ideas and plans and what she was working on, but never really seemed to have anything to show for it. When I talked to her about clients complaining that she wasn't getting back to them, she would always have an excuse about how difficult they were, how snowed under she was, and how she had written an email, but it must have gotten lost in spam, so on and so forth. Basically, never her fault. It got to the point where after one of our monthly meetings, I called her in and explained that if she couldn't get her tasks done, she needed to let us know so we could help delegate resources to make sure things weren't slipping through the cracks. I'll admit, I was pretty direct. Her performance was impacting the whole team, and my job was literally to keep the team on track. I get that people can be under pressure, that there can be stuff going on at home which impacts work, and that sometimes people need a bit of help. But if every time I ask about a project you say, yep, yep, everything's good, I've got it under control, and then it all falls apart, and your only response is to blame the client, we have a problem. I explained that I wasn't going to start formal performance management or anything like that, but from now on, I'd like her to check in with me on Monday mornings for 10 minutes to go over objectives for the week and to check if she needed support with any of her clients. I know it isn't fun to be micromanaged, so I tried to keep these check-ins short and mostly just offer assistance on stuff. She clearly hated my guts though, and apparently was hatching her own pro-revenge. Now, part of my role included use of a purchasing card, which wasn't in my name, but I had access to. I was given the card to basically make small purchases for the office or spend up to $500 on clients. The card was kept in an office I shared with another team manager where we both could access it when we needed it. 
one day, I get a call from accounts asking about a few abnormal purchases on the card. A Photoshop subscription, a couple of Uber Eats orders, an HBO subscription, etc. I say I don't know anything about them, and they should check with the other team manager. Apparently, the other team manager didn't know anything about them either, because after the weekend, I get called into the big boss's office. After my colleague and I had denied involvement, accounts had started calling Adobe and Uber and stuff to find out where the transactions were coming from. They said that not only were the accounts in my name, they were registered to an email address with my name in it too. Example, op at domain.com or something. I can't describe what it felt like to be in that meeting. I felt physically sick. I couldn't work out what was happening. I was so shocked I didn't know what to say. I felt like I was about to get fired, and I couldn't understand how that was even possible. The director was going on about how access to the card was a privilege, and that I had signed an agreement about appropriate use, and so on and so forth. I denied that I had been using it inappropriately, and the boss listened, but I could tell he wasn't that convinced. To be honest, in my head, I was gaslighting myself and worrying that I had somehow saved the card in Google and maybe my wife had accidentally been using it or something. It was terrible and I found myself apologizing and saying, I don't know how this happened. I assure you that I know that none of those expenses are appropriate uses of company funds. There must have been some kind of mistake. Can I please have the details and look into it, etc, etc. When I finally get out of the office, job still intact, barely, Evil was waiting for me at my office door. She was grinning from ear to ear and sweetly explained that she'd been waiting for our morning meeting. I told her something had come up and we'd do the meeting tomorrow. And she said, oh, will you be in tomorrow? Confused. Because I didn't know I was in a pro-revenge thread at the time. I just replied, yes, why would I not be in tomorrow? And she just sipped her tea and said, oh, no reason, turned around and went back to her desk. Something felt off, but I was still worrying about what had happened with the boss, so I spent the next couple of hours calling my wife, calling Adobe, and doing the same legwork that accounts had done. It became very obvious that someone had been using my name and the company card to spend a bunch of money online. Had I been hacked or something? Personal info on the dark web and these hackers just really wanted Photoshop and Wendy's delivered? It was the Uber Eats that was her undoing. After getting on the phone and talking through what had gone on and obviously giving my name for the account and everything, the fellow on the phone told me where the food had been delivered. It was in our city, which made me rule out straight away any notion of my data being sold online or something. Now I was suspicious and pissed. I don't like to think the worst of people, but now I was. Listening to my gut, I pulled up Evil's employee information and checked her address. I pulled it up on Google Maps, dropped a pin on her place, and then looked for the address Uber Eats had given me. It was the corner of her effing block. I was furious. When she left work for the day, I got IT to give me access to her laptop. Sure enough, when I opened up her domain.com account, under her listed accounts was op at domain.com. There were some things she had been smart about. The IP address she had been using was the office, which would have tied back to me. She even had the food delivered to a different address. She had even made a fake email address, but saving her passwords on a work computer was a mistake. I called the boss that night and explained what I had found and kept the IT guy with me to support the fact that I hadn't just logged into her computer and made it all up. The next day, the boss called her into the office and fired her so bad, there were red trucks lining up outside the building. When she teary-eyed left his office, I made sure I was standing in the hall sipping a cup of tea. It had gotten cold while I waited for her, but still tasted sweet. I hope she went home that night, because if she did, she would have received some nice goodbye Wendy's delivered by Uber Eats, paid for on my personal card of course. Revenge and justice can be the same thing, right? In the end, she was fired, the boss apologized, and we were on good terms when I left in October for a new gig. She never apologized, and I haven't seen her since. The boss decided not to get police involved, and neither did I. I just didn't want the hassle. I've honestly got to say that I don't think we've ever had a pro-revenge story from the point of view of the person that the revenge was against. 
and to think here she probably would have gotten away with it if she wasn't outside there waiting for you to come back and making snide comments about you not coming in the next day. She was like one of the dumbest criminals. Hey, maybe they would put her on that show. Hmm. This next story comes to us from Eggnards. I guess it's my business now. A tale in five acts. Let's jump right in. I wanted to post this tale here for a long time. I've started the post many times, walking away from the computer and giving up each time. Note that like many tales here, many trivial to the story details have been changed. What is important to note is that the way my industry runs is essentially via monthly service contracts with clients. There are three major players in the story, myself, OP, old owner, let's call him Steve, and new owner, let's call him Kyle. Act 1, do what you love. As an aimless teenager, I started working for a small business owned by Steve. It turns out I really enjoyed what I did. So slowly over time, my life plans shifted to make sure I could continue to work for Steve for the long term. This included transferring to a local college. And because the business was predominantly run on part-time hours, making sure that any other jobs I had never conflicted with the hours I was expected to work for Steve. Steve was flawed, but overall a good boss who mostly looked out for me. I certainly think over the years he had taken advantage of me in small ways, but looking back I really have no complaints. The thing is that while when I started working for Steve the business, name recognition was always directed towards Steve, over the years it eventually became, go to OP, he's the best. This got to the point where I do indeed truly believe that if I did not end up working for Steve, it's very likely his business would have been nowhere near as successful as it eventually became. As years went on, it was heavily implied that when Steve retired, the business would go to me. It was never specifically stated, but Steve did have a way about skirting around those types of issues and giving me hope. Act 2. Enter Kyle. About three years before COVID, Steve decided to retire and sell his business. He did indeed fulfill his promise by making a half-butt attempt to sell it to me at an unreasonable price. But it was very clear he already had another buyer in mind, Kyle. Kyle owned another local business just outside of our market area in the same industry. Because of the way the industry worked, there really wasn't much, if any, overlap in potential customers. But Kyle had a very large amount of money and was willing to buy. What is important to note here is that, again, I do truly believe that if I didn't play ball and agree to work for Kyle, my role was so integral to the operation at our business that there was no possible way a sale could go through. Over the course of negotiations, Kyle ended up buying the business and putting me in charge of running the day-to-day, -day, something I was mostly already doing but with a few more administrative tasks tacked onto it. The thing is, my name was still the name in town, and Kyle made zero effort to ever be on location, so nobody that did business with us ever really knew who Kyle was. Act 3. Kyle's kind of a dick, and how I learned to stand up for myself. All was well for a while. Kyle would openly talk about me being the head honcho at my location, and mostly left me alone to deal with my clients in the professional and personable nature that I had learned from Steve. Things first came to a head a year before COVID, when Kyle sent me to an industry conference for four days. I would need to take time off from my other job, which I was fine with. At the conclusion of the conference, I put in an hours request for the hours I spent at the conference, and I was super nice about it. Actually, I should have clocked all hours at the convention each day, but instead did not account for the hours for seminars that would help my boss, but were ones I had wanted to attend. The request was denied, and I was told, industry conferences are enriching activities, we pay for your admission, but they're on your own time. This took two weeks to resolve, but ended with me essentially saying, look, I'll still work for you because I love what I do. However, if I don't get paid, I will never go to another one of these conferences again to get new ideas for you. I was immediately paid. I will spare similar smaller stories of that nature, but that slowly started to become the relationship between Kyle and I. Act 4. COVID Hits When COVID hit, our locations were shut down, and for three weeks we weren't able to do anything. Meanwhile, our clients were still paying for services, and because Kyle had recently moved to a new client payment portal that I hadn't been trained on yet, I wasn't able to help any clients get their money back. 
At one point, I messaged Kyle about going virtual and being able to still assist clients and got a very angry text back, full of curses that essentially said, look, you're not the boss, go F yourself. You had your chance to be the owner and turned it down. I'm in charge. We did eventually go virtual about a week later. The big problem, of course, being that I would receive daily texts and emails and calls from clients about their membership and bills, and there was nothing I could do to help them. It was at this point that I knew crap was hitting the fan and I needed to start doing something. So over the course of the next two months, I did a couple things. Spent an inordinate amount of time studying the best business structures, communicated with all of the other staff at my location about my intentions, continued to give 110% to my clients in a virtual capacity, built a website and social media presence from the ground up. I don't think Kyle was expecting any of this, and he probably didn't also realize that because I often had to do back-end stuff from home, I also had what was essentially a little black book of every client, their email addresses and phone numbers. Act 5, Surgical Strikes. When everything was ready, I waited very patiently for the end of a service month. As I mentioned, all of our clients had monthly costs, and I didn't want to put anyone out of any part of their costs. On the last weekday of the month, I instructed the staff who would be helping clients that day to tell them to check their emails at the end of the day. At the end of the day, I sent out an email to all active and some non-active clients as well as a texting service to text everybody. I launched our social media accounts, our website, and had even enlisted a very small amount of trusted clients to spread the word via social media once I gave them the signal. Within 15 minutes of everything, my phone was ringing off the hook. I had 50 plus emails in my inbox from different people, and my Facebook accounts were completely blowing up with local chatter. I also heard from many of these people that they were calling Kyle to cancel their service. We hosted a Zoom meeting for all concerned parties, and essentially decided to take the weekend to clear up any confusion with the systems and start fresh and open our doors on Monday. Within an hour of everything, Kyle sent out a text blast to every client that they would be shutting their doors effective immediately. At the start of COVID, we had roughly 50 active clients at the business. On my first day of business, I had signed up 75 active clients, many inactive ones telling me, yeah, we stopped doing business with you guys because Kyle was kind of a dick. What is really important to keep in mind here is that I never wanted to nor cared to be a business owner. I was very happy working for someone else as long as I wasn't treated like crap. Had Kyle treated me even remotely better, the location would have continued to thrive and be stable in our local community. Kyle chose to be a dick to try and get quick money and cheat people, and Kyle lost out. We've been in business now almost two years, have nearly tripled Kyle's active numbers, and continue to be a staple in our community. One day, somewhere down the line, people are gonna learn not to piss off the one person who holds their entire business together. Oh, no, just kidding. That'll never happen. And a pretty quick direct message to bosses, but non-compete agreements are a thing, and obviously OP didn't have one in this case. So if you got people that you think might leave and start up another company, you need a non-compete in there as well. This next story comes to us from Danachius. Dealing with the locker thief in high school. Let's jump right in. This was back in the early 2000s, probably 2003 to 2004 school year. Throughout the entire year, there was a crime wave of people having things stolen out of their locked lockers. Not everyone, but enough that everyone knew someone had happened to. The school's only defense about this was that it was our fault for sharing our locker combos with our friends. They also charged us every time we had to get the combination changed on a locker, like after a theft for instance, because it was assumed to be our fault. Well, I had my graphing calculator taken out of my locker. I also never gave out my combination to anyone, mostly because my friends were jackbutts and we pulled crap on each other all the time. So I was out $150 for the calculator and another $150 to change the combination getting a locksmith to change out the lock. This is 2003 money, so it's a bit more than now. To anyone who has ever had to buy a TI-86 in 2003 or 2004, you'll know how much the things cost. Well, my dad was drinking buddies with one of the county detectives. I'll call him Detective Buddy and or Uncle Buddy. 
he went in to talk to the school about the string of thefts going on so he could get the security camera for the day my calculator went missing and got completely brushed off as it was a non-existent problem. And he must have given out his locker combination. The principal told him he would need a warrant to get the camera footage. Then, when he got the warrant, the school fought the warrant in court citing student privacy. Cue the pro revenge. Detective Buddy shows up at our house with a laptop in a laptop bag. He's like, throw this in your locker and tell everyone you know about your brand new laptop. Okay, sure Uncle Buddy. Three days later I show up at my locker between classes and the laptop is gone. The bag too, nowhere to be seen, as is a 24 ounce bottle of coke and possibly some pens. I take my phone out and text him that the laptop got taken. Stand by for the crap show. Oh, and you reported the theft to the police, FYI, he replies back. Okay, I reply confused. I got about the rest of my day and I don't hear anything back. The following morning, Detective Buddy comes to the school with three uniformed officers and pulls a student, Dave, out of class, as well as his mom who works in the front office. The principal is pissed. I don't actually hear the cops, but the principal is pissed to no end that he had the audacity to accuse them of theft and he couldn't just take them out of his school, etc, etc. Well, turns out there was a tracker in the laptop bag, and Uncle Buddy got a warrant to search the particular house. The laptop had a value of over $1,000, making it a felony. The next afternoon, he set up a tent with a table just outside of school grounds. He also had a banner across the top, If you have had something stolen from your locker, see me. By the next morning, Dave and his mom made the paper. Apparently, Dave allegedly used his mom's login information to get onto the school network and get the locker combinations for basically everyone. Then, he just opened random lockers looking for valuables to steal if he didn't get info of a specific locker to steal from. When he set up the stand to get more people reporting thefts, he racked up an astounding number of charges. Each locker counted as a separate misdemeanor unless the stolen object was worth more than $1,000, in which case it was a felony. In less than a week, Uncle Buddy opened and broke an investigation and they charged Dave and his mom with 9 felonies and 35 misdemeanor charges. When I finally got the story from Buddy, he explained what the situation was. He had me stash a brand new laptop that had GPS tracking units stuck in it in my locker then get it stolen deliberately, and then he got a warrant to search the property it had been taken to. Now the fun thing to stress is that the laptop was over a thousand dollars value, pushing the theft from a misdemeanor into felony level. There was also another eight felony charges, stuff like jewelry that was stolen from other people's lockers and recovered. So any of the locker break-ins that amounted to over a thousand dollars stolen was a felony charge and less than $1,000 was a misdemeanor charge. Cool thing was that because the calculator and the laptop were separate days, and the combination changed between the days, he caught a felony and a misdemeanor charge off me alone. The 9 felony thefts ended up in the $12,000 range total, and the 35 misdemeanor charges were somewhere in the range of $3,000 total in value. Now, that's an awful lot of stuff stolen, but I need to stress that this is only what was proven stolen, like this is what they caught him with in his possession that they could trace back to someone. They also didn't let them plead to anything. It was Podunk Phil's highest profile crime in years, and without a doubt, one of the worst crime sprees the county had seen in decades. Next up on the revenge, everyone who had been charged $150 to get their locker combinations changed sued the school district in a class action lawsuit. The justification was that the school did nothing to investigate the 44 proven and more than likely 200 plus cases of locker theft, and then charged money to get the locker combinations changed. There were 218 people in the class, and in total, everyone got $85 after attorney's fees. The principal also lost his job for being a bonehead and not bothering to attempt to deal with the massive problem that was reported to him going on at the school. The fun thing I need to point out is that the school brought in a locksmith to change out the locks. That's why they justified charging $150. Well, the school already paid the $150 a locker, but they also had to return $100 per locker, meaning that they were out $21,800 plus their legal fees for that class action suit. 
Next comes the criminal trial and the fallout. The prosecutor's deal was 10 years in prison, 5 in juvie and 5 in adult prison for Dave, and 15 for Dave's mom. Well, they refused that deal and it went to trial. Dave got one year prison for each felony, the state minimum, and one month probation for each misdemeanor, so nine years plus 35 months of probation. His mom received 18 years of jail and six years probation. Having attended much of the best parts of the trial, I will say this. They had Dave on camera entering 20 plus lockers and they had them in possession of stolen goods for every single charge they made against them. The judge was also not amused that there was likely other reported crimes that they got away with because they couldn't prove it or they weren't reported. Dave's mom got it worse. That was a fun sentencing to show up for. But the most important thing is that I got my graphing calculator back. It had my name engraved inside the battery compartment. I still have it, as well as a cool story to tell. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that this didn't happen in North America because, well, I mean, violent crimes here get less of a sentence than these guys did. Either this or it just didn't happen. But anyway, you guys can comment on that one down below. What do you think? Let me know. This next story comes to us from Objective Uncone. <laughs> Poaching threats and frogs. Lots and lots of frogs. Let's jump right in. This is another story about Pops, my grandfather, and how he got some sweet, sweet revenge done on squatters and poachers. This goes way back to the 90s. To be exact, 1998. I was 10 years old. My farm back then was Pop's family farm. It's way up north in Ontario. My farm is not a small farm. In the area, it's the biggest plot of land. Not only that, it has the most workable farmland. There's about 80 acres of good workable farmland that's including pastures and another 120 acres of dense forest and marshland. It is northern Ontario. Back in the 90s, northern Ontario had a breakout of this type of moth. They would spin silk high in the trees, Really, they caused no harm other than a nuisance, but the government had the great idea to crop dust the forest in Ontario, causing an ecological disaster. With the loss of the moths and the chemicals in the water, a type of frog was nearly wiped out. We called them leopard frogs. They are green with these big black spots on them. After that, they were put on the endangered species list. The back end of my property runs off into a small marshland and into the lake. And back in the 90s, Pops was having a problem with poachers. They were camping in the back area, hunting out of season, killing and eating turtles out of the marsh and just effing up the property. Back in the day, that forest was my playground. I know that area like the back of my hand, but unfortunately, I had a run-in with the poachers. They threatened to harm a 10-year-old child. Of course, I went out there with Pops and our local lawmen, but they had packed up and were gone before we got there. Unfortunately, they returned the week after. We could hear the rifle shots. Pops tried to find them with the lawmen several times, but with no luck. Now, here's where all the information from the start comes into play. Pops, as hard as he tried, wanted them gone, but it wasn't working. Pops was also a fisherman, and his favorite bait were none other than the leopard frog. But because they made it on the endangered species list, the use was outright banned. Pops being the responsible fisherman and generally caring about the land, figured, oh hell, now's the time to kill two birds with one stone. He approached the Canadian Fishery and Game Wardens and through a lot of work, got in touch with an ecological survey team who decided that our little marsh was the perfect place for a spawning pool to raise little leopard frogs. And that's what happened. The back area with our marsh was fenced in and they started breeding tadpoles to brood in our marsh. Not only that, the poacher's hunting ground happened to fall in the protected zone. Once the work happened, it took a full year for the poachers to return. But Pops had a weapon now, his phone. Once he could hear that familiar sound of pew-pews going off where no pew-pew fire should be, he made a single phone call to the game warden. They had over a dozen wardens up there in less than an hour, and the poachers were caught. Not only were they caught with the carcass of a bear and other animals, they were found with buckets and buckets of our little leopard frogs. They were caught, but not only did they hunt without a license, they also poached an endangered species to be used as an illegal bait. From what I learned through the locals, they did two years in big time prison. 
all because Pops cared about the little froggies. Oh yeah, over 5 million little frogs were raised on that marsh over 10 years, being released through marshes and forests in Ontario. You would have a hard time finding a leopard frog across Ontario that was not somehow related to a frog that came out of my little marsh. Well, your pop sounds like an awesome person, and those poachers, well, they're the scum of the earth, and they deserved every little bit of punishment they got. This next story comes to us from Sean McLeod 1138 Burning Vengeance. Let's jump right in. First, some context. There's this product called Pure Cap, which is basically 100% capsaicin oil, the stuff that makes hot peppers hot. It has a Scoville rating of 500,000 units per drop, but no flavor, making it ideal for spicing up food without affecting the way it tastes. Putting enough of it, usually only a few drops, on any food can make it almost completely inedible to anyone who is not a total firemouth pepperhead. It's available on Amazon for about 30 US dollars per two ounces, but a little goes a very long way. That's why it's sold in an eyedropper bottle. Now, here's the good part. In the early 2000s, my brother Rick was working in a call center that had a break room with a fridge and freezer, a microwave, and a small sink. He didn't take his own lunch often, usually leftovers from the previous night's dinner, maybe three or four times a month. But every time he did, it would get stolen. The first couple times he didn't mention it, you know, just in case it was a simple mistake, and the person was too embarrassed to own up. However, the third time, he remembered the military axiom, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, but thrice is enemy action, and reported the thefts to his supervisor, Don, and the head of human resources, Dolly, every time after. However, they said that without proof, there was nothing they could do. No cameras in the break room. And so, this is where my plan hatched. One night, I made a roast beef dinner with potatoes and carrots, cooked all day in a crock pot with onion soup mix on top. Believe me, it was fork tender and delicious. I also made a nice salad to go with it and put away a complete dinner serving for him to have for lunch on his next shift. The next night, he came home and said his lunch had been stolen again. So the next morning, I made a really deluxe roast beef sandwich, thickly sliced with lettuce, pickles, cheddar, and mayonnaise on an 8-inch hoagie roll. So whoever was stealing would think they'd hit the jackpot two days in a row. I also loaded the roast with pure cap, like four droppers worth, about 30 to 40 drops on the meat alone, and made sure it was all completely absorbed before closing the sandwich, so the roast looked really juicy. I even mixed some into the mayo and put some more on the bread, because bread tends to downplay the fire a bit. Rick came in about halfway through the pure cap application and asked what the hell I was doing. I looked back with an evil grin and said, Oh, just making a little present for the lunch thief. My grin was instantly copied on his face because he was the one who had originally told me about the stuff after he'd use it to prank a former roommate, so he knew what was going to happen. Then he went to finish getting ready for work. I could hear him chuckling the whole time. I even gave him $5 on his way out because that one sandwich shop with the green and yellow logo was only a couple blocks from his job and still had their $5 footlong promotion going. When Rick got home that night, his grin was even bigger as he related the events. He was between calls only a couple hours into his shift when suddenly there's this god-awful howling from the break room. Everyone who wasn't on a call right then, including Dolly, rushed in there to see the sandwich on the table with one bite taken out of it, the half-chewed bite laying right next to it, and Don at the sink desperately trying to wash the capsaicin inferno out of his mouth, not knowing that water only makes it worse. Don was ostensibly friendly and reasonable, so he was well liked by his people. I guess he thought that would make some sort of difference because he pointed directly at Rick and yelled, he tried to kill me, then went back to trying to put out his mouth fire with water. Dolly picked up the bag the sandwich had been in, which clearly had Rick's name in big red letters in his handwriting. She looked at Rick, Rick looked back with a completely straight face and shrugged. So Dolly grabbed the guy by the arm and dragged him to her office with him streaming tears and snot the whole way. By this time, the water had sent the pure cap into real overdrive. 
and Don had to just stand there and burn while Dolly and the call center's manager, Bill, dressed him down for about 15 minutes, finally ending it with his termination for theft. The guy could hardly even speak from the burning, tears, and runny nose that sandwich caused. And besides that, he had no defense anyway because he just outed himself for stealing an employee's lunch. The company had a zero tolerance policy about that kind of thing, especially when higher ups steal from the people they manage. Rick was back at his station and on a call when Bill personally came over smiling and said that Dolly wanted to see him when he was free. Rick gave a thumbs up knowing fully well why she wants to see him, took the call to its conclusion and went to human resources. Here's how he described the encounter. You wanted to see me, ma'am? Yes, I do. First, being the aggrieved party, you're not in trouble. Second, what the hell did you put in that sandwich? Actually, my brother made it. He pulls the bottle of Pure Cap out of his pocket and sets it on Dolly's desk with a smile. Dolly picks up the bottle and reads the ingredients list, which literally just says, Capsaicin oil, 500,000 Scoville units per drop. Bursts out laughing and hands it back. There was kind of really a lot of that in the meat and the mayo and the bread. Dolly was still giggling. You know what? Go ahead and take your lunch break now. And when you get back, we'll talk about making you that section supervisor. So he did. Rick still says that was the most emotionally satisfying sub sandwich he's ever had. He declined the super position though. So they promoted a different person from that section. A really nice lady, Carrie, who had also witnessed the sandwich debacle. The whole office laughed about it for weeks afterwards, and every new hire for at least a year got to hear the story, as both entertainment and warning. I smiled about it for a month, and both Rick and I rarely miss a chance to tell people about Pure Cap and its potential applications regarding lunch thievery. I never did hear anything else about Don, but I imagine getting hired anywhere else, not to mention being promoted to a managerial position, was fairly difficult with that huge red flag for theft on his record. Now, Opie added a little edit down at the bottom. It says, edit. Today, I just asked Bro about the incident and he's like, oh, I forgot to tell you. A couple days later, Don actually did try to accuse Bro of attempted murder, but both Dolly and Bill went to bat for him. It turned out that Dolly herself had confiscated the sandwich and the errant half-chewed bite, wrapped them back up, sealed the package with duct tape, and put it in the back of the break room freezer with a note that said, do not touch. So when it was found that it had nothing spoiled or toxic, as well as only Don's DNA, Don got hit with charges of false accusation and filing a false police report, double and had to pay for the legal fees and the cost of the testing. So apparently the murder attempt charge got shut down hard. After that, bro wasn't interested anymore and asked to never be bothered about Don again which Dolly, Bill, and the company lawyers happily agreed to. OP, this was a revenge story really well done. I think I would have changed it up just the slightest little bit though. I think I would have done the hot stuff right in the center of the sandwich and then some laxatives on either end. So regardless of which end they started from, they'd get into the laxatives and probably not know that they were there. And then the hot stuff in the center would just hit them. This next story comes to us from Thunder Kurg. I was called an ungrateful brat, so I acted as such. Let's jump right in. This whole thing happened a year prior, but the repercussions are still happening, and I hope they continue until the day the bee dies. This will be long, so buckle in. Background. Growing up, me and my sister had no love toward our father whatsoever. I'm not going to bore you with details, but alcoholic, abusive, violent are the few that come to mind. When my sister got accepted into a much better but also further high school than our local, she moved immediately and rarely visited. We were 10 years apart, so I was 4 at that time. I grew up resenting her for leaving me to deal with this BS all by myself, but now I understand better and we're on good terms. My local factory was so big that it supported my whole town. Virtually everyone worked there, so everyone knew each other. My parents too, but then it's purchased by the defense ministry and they decided to cut off anyone without at least a high school degree. My mother was let go, and this was after she'd had me four months. My father, however, made it until retirement and was granted military status. Basically, they gave him an honorable rank so his pension would almost double 
but also you'd have to act accordingly because, in terms of speaking, your military- My childhood was absolute nightmares, so needless to say, I turned out to be an absolute mess. Anger management and mental instability are notably the worst and I'm still working on them. When I turned 18, I enlisted. Two major benefits, it didn't cost money, and I could never come- For me, it was literally a highway out of hell. Fast forward three years later, I got an honorable discharge. Turned out, I had actual mental problems, who would have known? I got a bulk load of money and even more in the following months when they were able to process my military insurance. I came home to find my town incredibly underwhelming and my father hadn't changed a bit. Not wanting to spend the rest of my life in this hellhole, I took what I could and moved to the city where my sister was living. The last words dear old dad said to me was, you'd never make it, because apparently being discharged for a mental illness showed that I was a coward. Also, I think he didn't like that I was tougher than the boy who used to obey his every word that I once was and that I'd stood up for myself more in the few weeks I've stayed with him than the entire 18 first years of my life. I moved to a new environment, took up a blue collar job, I was pretty beefy thanks to the military, and decided to pursue a career in IT, all the while taking care of my mental health. When it all st Someone during this time, he got diagnosed with cancer. I was told it was not dangerous, but operations were required. My sister had actually reconciled with him, partly because of my mother, a few years prior and would occasionally bring my niece home to visit them. She was quite successful, so she decided to pay for the whole thing. Operations, treatment, hospitals, recoveries, it was all hers. She paid for this while moving into a new house and buying her first car. Those things are pretty expensive in my country. My father had a huge bank account because of his pension, but he didn't have to pay a single penny. After a year or so, he's on recovery, and all in all, things were good. During this time, I was struggling with working and studying, living paycheck to paycheck, and had to rely on a social program to get treatment for my illness. I visited him after every operation, though it wasn't anything tearful. If he didn't poke me, I was fine. After nearly a year of staying at my sister's house, he and my mother headed home after his doctor gave him a go. At that time, I was looking for a new job because the current job was horrible and it made my mental health actually worse. And I was lucky to find one where most of my skills were transferred and I had enough time to finish my studying. One day, my mother called in tears and asked me to come home that weekend. She told me that my father had been seeing someone else. Now, I must admit I'd not put anything behind this man but then I thought she was paranoid. She still is, up to this day, about everything. And I resented the thought of going home on a four-hour trip both ways, just for something that's utterly unimportant. So I calmed her and swept it under the rug. Fast forward a few months, I got another call, this time from my sister. She came to visit that week with my niece to inform them that she was three months pregnant. What was supposed to be a happy union turned into an absolute crap show. Apparently, when my father left his phone unattended for a few minutes, his mistress sent him a very sexy picture, and my mom saw it pop up. Needless to say, all hell broke loose. My sister said that was the first in many years that she saw my mother scream bloody murder at my father, and when he tried to hit her, my sister threw herself in between, which prompted her husband to throw himself in between, because, you know, she's three months pregnant. It all ended in a very teary trip back to our city after hours of hurling insults at each other. The only good thing that came out of it was my mother somehow was able to bring his phone with her. We convinced my mother to get a divorce, but she's the submissive housewife who thought divorces were worse than boiling live puppies. And I think back then, she's still somewhat hoping that he'd turn around. They've been together for almost 35 years at that point, so I figured something must have been there. She didn't want it, so we dropped it and decided to cut him out for good. Lo and behold, half a year after the incident, my father's side of the family started to contact me. I have a strict no-call policy where the only people allowed to call me outside of work hours are my mother, my sister, her husband, three of my best friends, and only recently, my boyfriend. So to my bamboozlement, my father, his sister, my aunt, his mother all called within a day. They suddenly acted so nice and convinced me to come visit them. 
Obviously, that was all a ruse. After the incident, my father side all blamed my mother and said she should have kept it a secret and not made a mess for the family's sake. They also disavowed me and my sister because we were ungrateful brats after we did not accept their ultimate argument. He's your father after all. Out of morbid curiosity, I ventured back alone to see what it was about. Turned out, they wanted to sell his house. It was on my grandmother's land. Back when he was about to undergo his first operation, we didn't know how it turned out, so he transferred the house to my name because apparently, inheriting a dead person's estate in my country is a living nightmare. Out of convenience, we convinced my grandmother to give me the land as well, since she was very old, 80 at the time. This was back when we were on good terms. I knew for sure they would rather gouge their eyes out than follow up with any of that if it happened a year later. I smelt something in the air. I couldn't place it, but I knew it was there. So I told them nicely that I would think of it and immediately went back faking an emergency. A plan formed when I was driving back, and that's the first time I'd been so pleased about anything, I actually cracked a smile. I went to my sister's immediately. My mom had been staying with her and laid out a plan. After a year living in the city, my mom was much more open-minded and it only took a little convincing for her to agree with the plan. The plan. My sister contacted a lawyer and asked what our options were. Because both the house and the land were in my name, they had no claim to them. And any paper that didn't have my signature on it would be considered useless under the law. They could try to claim it was rented out, but then they'd have to move far away in hopes that I'd never be able to locate them and I knew it'd be too much trouble for a couple of old folks. They could claim it's his life achievement because he and my mother never divorced. It's technically half hers as well. This is when I came up with an idea. I asked the lawyer what if my mother filed for divorce. He said it's highly unlikely the court would reward my mother's full claim unless we could prove that he was unfaithful before the separation. To his surprise, I could. Remember the phone that my mother brought back from that day? It was smashed during the fighting, but generally still in one piece. She asked me to throw it away a few days after, but my lazy butt just brought it back to my place and threw it in the loft. Sufficient to say it provided us with more than enough proof of his indecency. The execution. After weighing our options, I called to inform my father that I would come home the next month to make an announcement. He was eager to hear it. Upon my arrival, they were so nice and sweet and whatnot, but after I introduced my lawyer, it's like they flipped a switch and suddenly became vile and violent. I presented him with two options, relinquish any claim to the house or be served with a lawsuit. In my country, marital violations are six months probation minimum, up to two years in prison. After a lot of screaming and name callings and feet stomping tantrums, he kicked us out. So naturally, I assumed he chose the law. At the first hearing, my mom, me, and my lawyer were present. It turned out to be another screaming contest in which he made up all kinds of lies about my mother. At some point, my lawyer leaned in to tell me that if the officer didn't stop his rantings, it's likely that they were buddies and asked me to let him handle things. The officer told us this case wasn't a priority. It would take months to process. We wouldn't like the paperwork. It's best to settle this out of court. My lawyer politely declined and told my father to expect another hearing soon, under much less friendly circumstances. He tried one more tactic in between, which was calling all the relatives and telling them how my mother was a bee and I was an ungrateful brat in hope of creating some kind of pressure on us. Very few of them took his side, and even if all of them did, I would have never let him go that easy. In the second hearing, he finally cracked and agreed to my terms, which were relinquishing any claim you might have with the house and divorcing my mom. Basically, the only person who has any claim to the house now is my mother. I agreed to let him keep living in it for the rest of his life though, but not anyone else, aka his mistress, whom he was basically living with. The Revenge. This was where my work started. First, my sister gathered all the receipts from all the medical billing she has paid for his treatment. A few of them were missing, but we were able to put up a huge folder. I also crapped my pants learning how expensive cancer treatments could be. Not when we had a general sum of the money, we billed him for it. This is very unethical in my country since children are expected to take care of their parents. 
but we threw that out the window long ago. We also knew it was not a criminal case, so we just went to small court claims, and then sent in bailiffs to collect, which was just this lady. She went on with an I don't give an F attitude, and when he failed to comply, she sent in the thugs, I mean the police, to start seizing assets. So say goodbye to wooden furniture, a 27-inch smart TV, a fridge, and a reclining massage chair, all were bought by my sister as well. He had to pay out of his pocket because that lady insisted they continue seizing whatever he bought until she saw the money. Although the final amount was halved, my mother, under the eyes of the law, shared half of that for some reason, it still cost him 70% of his savings. Of course, this wasn't about the money, we were just petty. We told the moving company they could do whatever they wanted with the furniture. Looking back, I should have taken the recliner because my back hurts like a bee, even though I'm only in my late 20s. After that was done, I contacted my local factory to file a report. Remember the sweet pension he got with the condition that he behaved accordingly? Clearly, someone had been a bad boy. They let him go with it, even though it was a small town and everyone knew everything because nobody ever filed a report, but that's not the case anymore. I gave them a very detailed folder with pictures from his phone. To say they were sexual was an understatement. They immediately set up a hearing and he was stripped of his rank, making his pension down to just over half of the original amount. I know this because old folks gossip like their lives depend on it, and my mother is not excluded. She was very happy hearing about that. It's all she talked about in a month. I was about to be done here, but a week later, my sister called to tell me that my aunt came to her door to berate her and her children. My sister was working from home. My mom also lived there, but had gone out for some reason. My sister just called security to kick her out and warned me she could go for me next. I was seeing blood, not because of some lame butt Karen that could cause me inconveniences at most, but because she was screaming at my niece and nephew. As a gay man, I know full well the bloodline ends with me, so I put all of my love into those little guys, to the point that if I had been there, I would have bitten her head off. So I dug a little and found out my aunt was knees deep in debt. She was hoping she could leech some money off my father, if not from the money he made selling the house, then from his big bank account. Since neither of those was available anymore, she was very angry and thought she could lay it on my sister. You want to know what a man could do with determination and raging hatred? I never set up an online social presence, mainly because up to my 18th birthday, I was too poor to have a phone. And then the military taught me it wasn't needed. But for this special occasion, I made an exception. I created a Facebook account and befriended her. I didn't even have to pretend to be anyone, since old people apparently accept friend requests from anyone. She had this vibe where she'd show off her money and her vacations and her items like a wealthy person. From my mother and her trusty gossip circle, I knew that she always told whoever she owed money that she was struggling. So I figured she must be blocking them. The next part was easy. I just had to send all of her selfies to everyone she's owing to. I didn't have to declare myself since I was literally on a throwaway account. So it's just this really long line of messages that showed my aunt spending her money lavishly. For the next following month, she was threatened, not with legal actions like I did, but with much more sinister actions. She would have thugs, not the police, throw gifts at her door, like paint, fish sauce, and sometimes literal crap. My mother also told me this, of course. She finally figured out what I was going to do when I told her to find me a list of all the people she's owing to. The Pro Revenge. As much as I want to take credit for this, the idea wasn't mine. Forgive me if I once again had to lay out a bit of background. My father's side of the family is this very traditional family, where you would have a person acting as the head of the family, deciding things that matter. This was way before the war, so obviously they don't do such things anymore. But the head of the family still has a certain voice, and there's this once-in-a-year ceremony where we gather together to pay tribute to our ancestors. During the ceremony, the head of the family will give a speech, and then some announcements like who died, who got married, who gave birth, etc, etc. Then, there will be a celebratory part where we basically get crap-faced drunk. 
My great-grandfather was the head. He had three sons, and two of them died during the war. So my grandfather took the mantle, then my father, and eventually me. This whole side of the family is in another town that's like three hours away from our town. Mainly because my grandfather didn't expect to be the head, so he moved out seeking opportunities. I found these gatherings redundant and unnecessary, but that year I was actually looking forward to it. My father tried to keep the actual date hidden, it wasn't fixed, but generally somewhere in June. But he seriously underestimated my mother. She doesn't have a gossip circle. She has an infinite number of them. So my mother, me, and my sister's family all head back for it. The trip was 14 hours in total, but the result was worth it. We timed it so we would come two days earlier than my father. Again, thanks to her gossip circle. This side of the family had never heard the full story before, only the version my father gave them which was that he and my mother left in good faith. I actually gave my father some credits for not badmouthing my mom. After weighing all the pros and cons, we decided to let my mother loose, and she's exceptional when it came to relaying details about her personal tragedies. I kid you not, if I had posted her story word for word, by this time next week, there would be a global Justice for Thunder Keg's mother movement. It took just one day for everyone to know what a butthole my father had been. The look on his face when he arrived with my aunt and my grandmother and saw my family already there was priceless. He got the stink eye from everyone for the rest of the day. Nobody would initiate conversations with him, so he's just sitting there like a sad dog. Now, I know what they said about dead horses, but this idea was brilliant not to follow through. My uncle, let's call him Oliver, came up with this. In the hierarchy, he's equal to my father. And in the event that my branch doesn't have a male successor, 100% what's going to happen, his branch will be the head of the family. He told me I should take up the mantle of the head. It was very sudden. I didn't have a speech ready. My father was supposed to do that. But Oliver told me I could just tell whatever I want because nobody really paid attention to that thing anyway all the other elders were okay with it. The speech wasn't even the best thing. At the celebratory party, people will be assigned tables based on the family tree. Heads of each branch will sit together, their children sit together, the elders sit together, so on and so forth. Because I was elevated to the head of my branch, I would be sitting at the big boy table. My father didn't even get to sit at my supposed table because, miraculously, it was full, even though I could have sworn there weren't 20 of us and each table can sit up to 10. He had to sit at the regular table with my aunt and a bunch of nasty widows who didn't hold back on their snarky comments, so I was told. I don't think he'll ever come back to one of those anytime soon. The Aftermath My father is now just a miserable old man. His mistress left him because, surprisingly, she was after his money. He's living in our old house with next to nothing. His retirement money, though halved, was good enough for him to live by. Last I heard, his cancer has come back, and obviously this time my sister won't be paying for it anymore. He had tried to initiate contact with my mother, trying to make amends. We had to block his number and his profile on my mother's account, because she actually considered it. She has her soft sides. My aunt has to sell her house to pay for all the debt, or else they'd just continue harassing her. She now lives in a small house she bought off with the rest of her money. I felt bad for her husband because he's actually chill and quite nice, but he's not the most decisive and therefore doesn't really confront her. I hope he's doing better. I have no empathy for her only son though, let's just say the apple doesn't even fall from the tree. How do I know all of this? My mother's gossip circle. I left my grandmother out of this because she's very old. She's not demented in any way, she's perfectly sane, but she loved her son too much to admit he's in the wrong. Also, she was very nice and sweet to me growing up. A lot of my good memories are with her. I'm sad because she doesn't see my mother the same. I also stopped talking to her and would only visit once during Lunar New Year. She's lived in the small house she and my grandfather built on the land that's now in my name. When she and my father are dead, I will carry out her wish to build an altar for her and my grandfather. Whether or not my father will be included is still up to debate. This is one of those pro-revenge stories that kind of rides the line between pro-revenge and nuclear revenge. 
I think if he were kicked out of the house altogether and not allowed to stay there until he died, this definitely would have pushed past that nuclear revenge boundary. One other thing I wanted to mention right at the end here is that OP mentioned in a comment that they are Vietnamese and English is not their first language. OP, you have better English than a lot of people I know who have only spoken English their whole lives. This next story comes to us from a Crafty Bureaucrat. I orchestrated a vast conspiracy to get a coworker fired. Let's jump right in. Using a throwaway because the details are specific and hard to change. I used to work at a hospital data center in the network operations group. We physically sat in a room 24-7 next to the servers to make sure things didn't catch on fire, monitored for alerts, and did routine things like swap out tape backups. But it was pretty simple work. This was ostensibly a tech job, but there were people who had been there for many years back when you had to change out printer paper and run a command from an IBM mainframe. It was on really specialized hardware and software that was difficult to apply elsewhere, so it had become a dead-end job. And because there were people who weren't tech savvy at all really, we weren't given much responsibility. You can't tell some people they can log into a server and others not. So we were reduced to the lowest common denominator. We were a network operation center where nobody was allowed to interact with any network equipment. Lowest common denominator, you say? Meet my new supervisor, Karen. Not her real name, but definitely her real spirit. Had been there for over 20 years and got the job solely based on seniority. She was a sociopathic narcissist and one of the most unpleasant people I've ever encountered. Shortly after I was hired, we were bought by another hospital and combined data centers. Karen was demoted to shift lead and had to work with us in the 24-7 rotation. She was very bad at her job, and our responsibilities diminished to very little. We had no agency to fix any problems of our own because it had to be a problem that Karen could solve, and Karen was both lazy and stupid. After a couple of years, I was promoted. On my first day after they announced the promotion, she said, you will fail, just straight to my face. But she had a powerful tool at her disposal, the hospital bureaucracy. Since the place was unionized, the hospital had a just cause firing policy instead of an at will policy, even for non-unionized employees. This is, I think, generally a good thing. But on the edges, it set up ridiculous situations where it was impossible to lose your job unless you were really egregious about it, with repeated violations, or you showed up drunk or high. We had someone steal computer equipment and they kept their job. It was nuts. And Karen had been there for nearly 30 years, so she wasn't getting fired without a lot of work. That's okay, she was terrible at her job. One of the most important things about the job was monitoring for an alert which would pop up and there was a procedure we had to go through in order for some data to go through. If we didn't do this, then a nurse wouldn't get their lab results back. So in one case, an alert came in, Karen saw it, then decided to keep browsing the web. Because of this, a patient from the cardiac ICU was going into surgery and the doctors and nurses operating on the patient couldn't get a white blood cell count, I think, I'm not a doctor, I just work in a building with a lot of them. Something very dangerous for this patient, and the patient died. This still did not get Karen fired. The reasoning from HR, well, it didn't directly lead to harm. She didn't even feel bad about it, just a complete soulless sociopath. I'm real pro-worker in general, but some jobs you just absolutely have to do. I was so mad, she had to go. I kept a paper trail of everything she messed up on. It wasn't nitpicky, literal life and death stuff here. Verbal warning, first written warning, second written warning, final written warning, termination. A slog, and I'd rather spend my time doing anything else, but that's the way it went. Then, she figured out she could work the system. As she approached work Armageddon, termination, she would tell HR she was being harassed. The person harassing her was different every time, which would trigger a mandatory investigation. This investigation took about six months. They wouldn't find anything and we would carry on. Except these warnings, they had a six month expiration. So she could always reset the clock when it got close. Everyone was helpless. Even the CIO couldn't do anything about it because of the bureaucracy. 
Karen was a menace and the entire IT department had to interact with the data center staff, and that meant interacting with her. And she was universally disliked. And she had 20 years until retirement, and she would outlast the heat death of the universe. Then I had an idea. What if, under the guise of developing skills relevant to the 21st century, required everyone working in the Network Operations Center to pass the NetPlus exam? It's not a difficult exam, but it's not trivially easy. I felt pretty sure that everyone on the team fell above the line between able to pass and not able to pass, except Karen. We would give everyone better titles, a significant pay raise, and entrusted to do more with the equipment which is something everyone desperately wanted. Then, people could actually leave the hospital with transferable skills and do something else if they wanted and not feel trapped. I spent three years in meetings with HR, with my director, with the CIO, with HR again, job description meetings that took six hours to tweak small wording, hundreds of hours in meetings, red tape hell, absolute red tape hell. Do you have any idea what it takes to approve a significant raise in a bureaucratic muck factory like that? But the raises were crucial, because it would absolutely not be fair to ask this of them. Pass a test, or lose your job, without a large carrot attached would lead to mutiny. And then it got approved. I also wrote the exam requirement into my own job description. It was important to still be able to do the job, and not let my skills lapse just because I was promoted. Also, this meant I could cover for people when they were on vacation or sick. Plus, I also got that sweet, sweet pay bump. It went over well. I was nervous, but the plan made sense and I was able to communicate that. People would be more marketable, the job would be more interesting, and most importantly, they would be making 20% more than they were before. And I think it really helped that I also gave myself the same requirement when I absolutely could have chosen not to. The hospital would pay for off-site training. They would still get paid their full hourly during the training, including shift differential for second and third shifts. We paid for all the materials. I scheduled eight hours a week for people to go to someplace quiet and study. The job itself had a ton of downtime so people could study, but this was formally carved out time anyway. We paid for the exam, and if they failed, we'd pay for the second attempt. We were given eight months to pass the test, so this is how it was for the eight months. I did not want Karen to have any excuse whatsoever, and somehow convince HR that this process was rushed or unfair. Everyone passed on the first attempt, except Karen. Karen did not pass her second or third attempt, a bonus attempt. Karen, being the classic narcissist, thought this was somehow all about her, that this was a vast conspiracy engineered over multiple years and hundreds of hours just to get rid of her. And she would tell everyone within earshot that's what was going on. Yeah, okay, Karen, you realize how insane that sounds, right? Not everything is about you, sheesh. Well, okay, in this case it is, but still, only I and two other people know that. I remember the exact time and date we told her. She was in such deep denial that it could ever happen. She thought she was bulletproof. I don't think I will ever achieve anything more satisfying in my career. I'm not usually one to take satisfaction in seeing someone's livelihood go, but she was uniquely awful. She was a patient danger, and it had been nearly a decade of working with her by this point, and I was just so sick and tired of her BS. I was a hero the day after she was fired. I went to the main office for a meeting and people were congratulating me like I had just had a kid or won a marathon or something. Even the CIO. They were just happy for me that I didn't have to supervise Karen anymore. But in my headcanon, they were congratulating me for pulling off this elaborate plan. Morale back at the data center was also high. We learned interesting things. A couple of my coworkers left for better gigs elsewhere. The ones who were content staying were able to stay, and we all had more money and job security. And because anything could set off a BS Karen harassment complaint, people were stressed out working with her. Her being gone was like a breath of fresh air. Newcomers were told stories of Karen, and they seemed exaggerated. They were not. 
In order to solve a very important and extremely difficult problem, I pulled off a vast workplace conspiracy that improved the lives of the people I worked with in addition to keeping our patients safe. Getting Karen fired is my greatest and most difficult accomplishment, and I can't put it on a CV anywhere. Now, there were a whole bunch of comments after this story about the fact that Karen didn't get fired after causing the death of a patient. But there was also another comment down there from a doctor. It says, I'll bite and say Karen's not on the line for that one. No matter what the test was, if it wasn't ready by the time she went into cardiac surgery, it's up to the surgeon to decide whether to proceed or not. Not Karen's fault on that one, but I don't know about the others. To cap this one off completely, we'll just go with a quote from Oscar Wilde. Some bring happiness wherever they go, others whenever they go. This next story comes to us from Objective Uncown. Pops makes dirty, dirty thieves literally eat crap. Let's jump right in. I have really loved sharing stories about my pops, my grandfather, the man who raised me, and I thought I would share another story of Pops just being Pops. Pops lived on the family farm his entire life, and that's where this takes place. It's mine now. The farm itself is huge, 80 acres of grazing and hay production land. Pops mostly raised cows and chickens and another 120 plus acres of forest, marsh, and wetlands. Up near the main house, Pops had his veggie and berry garden. Strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, all the berries. Pops liked to make his own homebrew, blame the Irish DNA. One fine summer morning, August of 2001, Pops is returning from town and he is greeted by a couple in their 30s hauling butt to their car, parked at the front of our property, each with 40 liter buckets. Pops checked out what had been going on. Almost half the berry bushes had been stripped clean. Pops was not the type to fly off the handle, but he took a trip to town to look for the car, and he found it. It was a couple out-of-towners, and Pops gave them a stern warning not to come back. The next morning, Pops was doing his normal start-of-the-day routine, make breakfast, wake me up, to do chores. After we got out, Pops saw them again hauling butt back to their car. Pops jumped into his truck, caught up to them, and told them off, said if they ever come back, it's going to be hell for them. We woke up the next day to find tire tracks on the field and each and every berry bush stripped clean. We later found out they'd been hitting up farmer's markets selling fresh berries. Pops, not being the kind of person to take things laying down, especially if someone's effing with his future booze. There's a lot Pops did to ensure he was protected for the future, but I'm going to give you the short version. Pops decided to expand his berry operation to the entire field as well as get the farm licensed to produce and sell berries. And early September, I remember this well, made me do half the work. We filled the entire front field, planted several hundred strawberry, raspberry, blackberry, blueberry bushes. One thing, they are perennial plants. The season they are planted will be very light fruiting, but the next growing season, they explode. Pops fenced off half the field and left a good portion open to easy access. Pops knew they would be back next year. He knew they believed they found a golden goose, free money. Well, the start of next growing season, Pops had a special fertilizer ready for the open part of the field, raw human waste. Now, the thing about spraying the soil and plants with that is it's not treated, even cow fertilizer is treated. But in its raw state, the plants being sprayed daily, well, it will make the berries putrid. It gets deep into them, and no amount of washing will get it out. And Pop sprayed every bush on the not fenced inside every darn day and waited. And as Pops predicted summer of 2002, they came back. He caught them again, buckets in hand, hauling butt back to the car. Again, Pops confronted them with a stern warning, warning they will regret taking and eating the fruit. It wasn't even 24 hours later they were back this time with the law in tow, screaming up a fury that Pops tried to poison them. Pops just smiled and said, I warned you not to come on my land and steal from me. Them berries aren't for eating. The cops were about to tell them to just F off and not come back when Pops said, oh, wait a minute. Pops came out with all his licenses packed in a neat little file folder, licensing his land that was already zoned for agricultural use as a licensed food production farm. The cops' eyes lit up like, oh, I know what you're getting at. You see, up here in Canada, 
it's a bit of a big crime to steal from a farm, even more so if it's got all the licenses to produce food. At this point, I was out on the porch watching everything go down. The lawman screamed at them to sit their butts down while he called back up. They were taken off our land in cuffs. So not only did they get a mouthful of human waste filled berries, but walked out getting over a $10,000 fine. Really and truly, the only way to wrap up this story is to sit back and think about Pops walking away from this whole situation with a shit eating grin. This next story comes to us from C. Kentner 4212 I was told to do what I needed to do, so I did it. Let's jump right in. This is very recent. I was living in a very bad part of a major metropolitan city that has lots of bad parts. After I moved in, I started noticing a lot of things that were unsafe. Most of the things I brushed aside because they didn't necessarily affect me. Three things I complained about were the fact that the common areas in most of the bedrooms had no smoke detectors. Then, because I get home when it's very dark, I complained about the porch lights not working. I was promised over and over that this would be fixed, but it never was. I pressed harder and threatened to call the city. I also withheld my rent at this point. The landlord told me, there's nothing wrong with the house, do what you need to do. So I did. I called the city. An inspector came out and I showed him around the property. There were areas I couldn't give him access to, like the garage or the other tenant's rooms. He took lots of pictures and pointed out dozens of safety issues and building code violations. Turns out this slumlord converted a two-story house, four bed, two bath, into a three-story house with nine bedrooms and nine bathrooms, with no permits from the city. He also had the home classified as an owner-occupied single-family home, although it was clearly not as there was no owner-occupancy and there were 10 unrelated roommates. The landlord harassed me through the whole process. She took my parking spot away and pitted other roommates against me. To make matters worse, she told everyone I wasn't paying rent. So now I have these bees ganging up on me. It was so bad that I couldn't be in any of the common areas for even one minute without being harassed. I also got a bunch of notices accusing me of random things and an eviction notice because I wasn't paying rent. The report from the city came out and it had over a dozen violations, including some very serious ones. It was going to cost him tens of thousands of dollars to repair the house to get it up to standard. The house started to become safer. There were smoke detectors, railings for the stairs, working porch lights, a carbon monoxide alarm, and he was forced to put a railing on a balcony that had none. Through all of this, he's making $10,000 per month in rent, charging for parking, and there's another large house on the property that he's renting. Plus, he has multiple homes, 90 tenants in total. This guy was making tons of money, but somehow, the sentiment among some of the roommates was, how could you do this to this poor old man? My case went to court, and I got more time to find legal help. By the time the second hearing came along, another notice had been given, as they got access to the entire house. Plus, they were still in violation, and had not cured all the problems, so they got fined daily. Then, my court date was a week away, and his attorney started to try and negotiate with me. I was asking for $16,000 and they knew I was going to get it because they were going to lose. I ended up settling for $7,000 and 30 days to move out, plus 8 months of rent forgiveness. I just did what I had to do. Laugh out loud. I honestly think the landlord got off easy in this case. I mean, the safety of everybody in that house was at risk because none of the building work was done to code. I was thinking like fines in the $100,000 range and maybe even a ban on renting by the tribunal. I don't know, something like that. Glad OP got to walk away with a little bit of money though. That definitely makes it easier to get into another place. This next story comes to us from Infinitium Vortex. Director said process contracts faster and don't fuss over details. Okay, you'll lose bonus. Let's jump right in. Initially had this story in r slash malicious compliance but came across this subreddit through comments. I work with a federal contractor responsible to buy or bundle hardware, software, etc. Any government organization needs and review the contract in terms of financial viability and legal clauses. In other words, ensure we make money and we are legally covered. 
the contracts ranged from $5,000 to $40 million. Last year, our company went through a reorganization, fire people, and give more work to people still left with the company while paying us peanuts. We are a small company with less than 200 employees and trying to retrain our government customers while big companies like Amazon Cloud will replace us in less than 10 years. The government customers love working with us because this is the only thing we do and treat the customers better than the big contractors who don't care. They laid off 30 people from my team of 50, so now 20 people do the work for 50 people at the same salary. We are paid by the month and not work hours, and we don't get sales bonuses, important in the story. I have a habit of reviewing everything carefully and spending hours on each contract, even one that just makes us a few thousand dollars. Government vendor selection process is slow and they are very risk adverse, so a lot of customers start at a few thousand dollars and end up in an eight or nine figure contract if everything goes well. Since people were laid off, I was struggling with the work volume and as a result, contracts were piling up. The sales director from a different team did not like me as I was slow and also catching any tricks the sales team tried to play by over promising the customer or something shady. Government clients and customers loved working with me, the support I provided, and was truthful regarding our capability and our drawbacks. This was something else the director hated me for since he thought I am tanking sales. However, almost all my clients were repeating customers for over a decade. Example, sales wanted a school district to buy outdated Dell Windows laptops, while entire state was moving towards new cheaper Chromebooks. Schools don't have a budget and whatever they buy stays for five plus years. Sales were offloading expensive useless stuff to get better bonuses and also charge customers nearly a million dollars to provide IT support for faults arising from ancient hardware. During my conversation with the school district, I shared examples of state governments in the Northeast buying Chromebooks and saving money while future-proofing the hardware. My job was to get the best quote to the customer and develop trust to sign a 5 or 10 year contract. So this school district bought Chromebooks which were 40% cheaper and had less than 20% of the previously quoted IT support cost. As a result, sales team lost a few thousand dollars in bonus but we brought this customer with us for a 5 year contract. The sales director got pissed as I was working on small contracts at a slow pace and reprimanded me in front of our manager. The manager didn't care and did not defend me and asked, why don't you follow what the sales director says and stop fussing over small contracts? I said small contracts turn into big ones, hence I should pay attention to them as well. Mistakes in small contracts could harm us if the contract becomes big. I am struggling at work because you gave me the job of three or four people. At this point, he was shouting at me that I don't understand contracts. He has been doing this stuff for five years and he makes more money in a month than I do in a year, so I should listen to him and not question him. This was a bit insulting, as I live in a shared apartment and am struggling to make ends meet while he drives an expensive luxury car and just goes out on fancy lunches with government employees. I asked the sales director to send an email with a list of suggestions to improve my work. He rudely complied and said, can you not even remember what I just said in the meeting? His email said, do not review contracts less than $100,000 and trust the sales team that due diligence has been done. I replied by copying my manager in the email that this could create liability in the future and want him to confirm again that the sales team will do financial and legal compliance themselves for the small contracts and I need to stop revising small government contracts below $100,000 with no exceptions unless told otherwise. This was gold. Q malicious compliance. Instead of two hours, I spent 10 minutes on small contracts and voila, backlog cleared and I am home by 6.30 p.m. Now a contract worth $10,000 comes through. I found some issues with this contract since it said that we offered 30% rebates to our software providers. This was something we stopped doing five years ago and now we just offer software providers a five to 10% rebate on contracts. Also, I knew the government client recently got a massive budget and was on a spending spree, part of my job. There is a high chance that this $10,000 customer will become a $100 million customer and the 30% rebate means we have to give $30 million on top of the usual cost. 
but I remembered what the sales director said. Why don't you follow what the sales director says and stop fussing over small contracts? So 10 minutes later, I email, no issues detected based on compliance check by the sales team. As I mentioned, government contracts are slow. No one cared or raised the 30% rebate issue since it was just a $10,000 customer. 10 months later, the state government customer said they want to work with us and get at least the same terms or better terms for a new $50 million contract. This was the largest contract in our company's history. The sales director happily gave him a handshake deal that we will offer the same or better terms. Government can legally just buy more on their current contract, so the sales director had no issues promising the same terms. Given the contract size, everyone from legal, IT, and finance gets involved to work on just one contract. For three months, everyone worked on one contract. The sales team was giddy that they will get million dollar bonuses. I don't get a sales bonus to ensure I protect customers and the company. The finance team finishes their review and said the company is going to lose $8 million and not make any money. Everyone is shocked. The sales director gave a deal without checking with us and we cannot go back on something we offer. Changing contract terms is frowned upon by the government and they have legal contracts stating nothing will change. We are legally obligated to offer the government the same terms for three years. The legal team says we need to take a hit on our balance sheet and swallow the losses. The CEO called a big meeting in a fancy conference room with big TV screens and everyone had to find a scapegoat to take the blame. Every department lead, managers, and people involved in this contract were summoned. The sales leader had to explain to his team why they won't get bonuses on this big contract they spent over three months. Finally, legal and finance meet and share their findings. We lost money due to the 30% rebate clause. The sales director goes crazy and blamed me in front of everyone and asked me to pack my stuff in front of 30 people. Follows by saying I am terrible at my job despite 100% customer satisfaction. I calmly opened my laptop and connected the display cable and opened Outlook while displaying his email on three big TV screens, stating that I should stop reviewing small contracts. While all 30 people read the email with a faint smile, I await the sales director's reaction. He goes into rage mode, claiming I misunderstood his email and am terrible at my job. Then I scroll down where he ignored my warning regarding potential liability to the company, and his response explicitly asked me to ignore that. His face turned white when he realized he effed up. He then blabbered trying to find some other scapegoat, making tirades against our IT consultants in Vietnam, and just lost it. Aftermath. I was told to spend two to three hours on each contract and the company eventually figured out that it is cheaper for them to hire 20 people like me and pay us $70,000 every year than to take big losses on their contracts. Our team has 40 members now, still less than 50, but enough to offset the contract volume. Because of the losses, sales director had to pay back his previous year's bonus as he had a clawback clause with the company. If you screw up, you need to pay us. The sales director had to pay nearly $300,000 and was fired from his job. Present day, he then sued our company for wrongful termination and we just heard today that he lost the case and now owes us another $200,000 in legal fees. Now he owes over half a million to our company. Now, this isn't quite the end of the story. OP added a couple of updates on at the bottom. Here's the first one. It says, Update 1. A lot of people may ask, why am I still doing this job, which pays less than state wages, and I might be able to make more in other companies. I help government customers buy good stuff from many hardware and software companies, so they don't overpay or rely on one big company. I feel proud when I can save tax dollars and help customers. During COVID, a lot of state governments went remote, local meetings on Zoom, and keeping the government running while working from home. There was a budget freeze due to COVID, the economy shutting down, and since COVID relief bill was months away. This was a time when the sales team had helpless government customers willing to sign anything just to get remote hardware and software. I saw this as extortion, and despite being an introvert who lacks initiative to get promoted, I was able to convince the CEO to offer free 60-day trials of expensive hardware and just charge setup and transportation fees. 
This was a big risk, but we brought an insurance company to offset any damages. I convinced the CEO that this is the time for us to show we are partners with the government, and it was an emergency. The sales team was mad for a month, then realized that all those free customers were calling us for paid contracts over companies that are 10 times our size, that would usually win contracts by lobbying or taking government decision makers to expensive lunch or something like Super Bowl tickets. I legally cannot disclose the exact government entity by name, but can vaguely say that some entities in the state government of New York and the state government of Florida were both using this trial program during the first wave of COVID. I might change jobs soon since we got a 3% salary hike in the current market, while the company has nearly doubled its revenue in a few years. Update 2. I just remembered another story that made sales leaders hate me even more. This is during the COVID wave when we are all working from home and I was getting used to Zoom. We had a telecom contract with a state government during COVID and everyone joined a Zoom call to discuss the contract. The sales team was increasing this customer's telecom bills from 60,000 a month to 300,000 a month. I objected that increased calls during COVID are not high enough to justify such a big price hike and we should increase the bill to 100,000 a month this was enough to cover the cost and even improve profit margin. But the sales team started laughing and saying if the customer can pay more and is ready to pay more, why am I being so vocal? Leadership asked me to shut my mouth and proceeded with a $300,000 contract. So I started working on other stuff and minimized the Zoom app. I don't end Zoom calls myself as the meeting admin ends it. Everyone said, bye, nice meeting you all, and I naively assumed the call ended. I vented my frustration by saying, these salespeople are like wolves when the country is going through crappy times. A coworker sent a chat message a few minutes later that everyone heard what I just said. No one complained or confronted me, but this offended them. Also wanted to add all sales team members are not like this. Almost all the new sales reps are eager to learn from everyone and not pushing stuff, but talking to customers. However, new sales reps mostly handle small or low priority contracts. Any big contract gets automatically transferred to sales leadership. OP, not very many people have a conscience at work. That's unfortunately just how it goes. You can see that in your bosses and some of the other people around you. You though are the kind of person that these company needs. The kind of person that keeps a company grounded and does the best things possible for the customers. And while the bosses may not understand what you're doing, or what the long-term benefits of what you're doing can be, you know what it is and you know how much money you can make for the company in the future. You are an asset, one that they can't afford to lose. Remember that. This next story comes to us from Wrecked Your Crap. <laughs> Partner with limited authority over management, playing from workers dugout though. Let's jump right in. I had recently partnered with a small production facility in my area. Our contract was based on capital investment along with designing and implementing new automation processes. Two-year outlook finished in eight months. Was a typical small production facility comprised of 50 production workers through two shifts of 12 hours that ran two days on then three days off. Also had two production supervisors for each shift and one maintenance supervisor for each shift. The people and their attitude is ultimately what led to my decision to be more than an outside contractor for this company until I worked the night shift for a week due to shutdowns that needed to occur to implement certain line upgrades. This is where I met him. We will call him Richard Head. Eh. Richard seemed like a nice guy in our first few encounters, and then I heard him in his element directing his maintenance crew at night over the radio. He would belittle this group of guys who were there to do a set task list every night for whatever machinery they were doing preventative maintenance on unless something broke on the line, which would require attention first, obviously. I have never heard grown men spoken to like this and never heard any nasty remarks back or defending themselves. He would call them stupid on the radio if they were having trouble troubleshooting a problem, call some fat and lazy, called one a racial slur. The guy had been there since they opened the doors and to be honest, made me want to rescind any commitment I have ever made to this company. When I escalated this up to the plant manager, he assured me that it was friendly banter and they rarely had complaints against him. True because anyone who ever did so in confidence of anonymity was always outed and then singled out until they were terminated by him. 
Since no one was going to listen to me, I decided to do my due diligence and started to document everything I heard on the radio with a date and time, witnesses to the treatment, and what rights the individual was having violated due to our state and federal outlines. I made this spreadsheet my entire time in the shift, documenting every personal account I witnessed as well. Harassment is a major problem with industry work, but the one that I have learned is the company killer is retaliation. If you can prove that, then they stand no chance. I saw him one night tearing down this 50-year-old man who requested two days off to the point that I wanted to lose my cool. I knew it would ruin all the information I was gathering. Days off were because his nephew was just in a car accident two days prior and had to have multiple reconstructive surgeries scheduled. I knew that now was the time to move on everything. I rounded up all the maintenance guys and shared all my documentation with them. They didn't realize the importance of this information like I had. They just said nothing will change. Nothing changed because no one treats an issue as an issue if you come with incorrect non-detailed information. The fact that he used the radio so much was a godsend that they didn't see as well. When he spoke this way to people, he must not have ever realized that there are other supervisors on shift and that they, in fact, unintentionally became the strongest witnesses in the case especially when you have some audio recordings verifying the accounts. They have no choice but to acknowledge what they have heard. Each worker took their logs, and even though I have capital and time investment in this facility, I urge them at a minimum to petition to have this man removed or to threaten legal action. Once they coordinated a day to expose all this, it was like watching a sports movie when the underdogs take the championship and get the girl at the same time. Not only did the man finally get fired, but the entire atmosphere around the place changed more than I could imagine. Older machines ran the best they have ever ran in my time there, and people loved coming to work again. They also put a placard on my door for when I came in about a week later. It said, number one boss, but the boss was crossed out and hand engraved under it was the word badass. I obviously removed it from my door, but I put it in my home office and it probably is the best thing I have ever received from a facility. Unfortunately, in a lot of places like this, the workers can't stand up and say something because they can't afford to lose their jobs. They've seen other people lose their jobs in the past to have stood up, and they know it could happen to them, but it's really hard to get another job. A lot of times, they're just waiting for that one person to take the reins. OP, it looks like you did that. You got these people out of a really crappy situation, you got them enjoying work again, and because of that, the place is running more efficiently. I say, that's a job very well done. Our first story today comes to us from Kibu Fox. Cancel a land lease and hope to make a windfall? Hope you like a lot of dirt. Let's jump right in. Let me preface this by noting that this revenge was not my doing. At least, not exactly. It happened back in the 90s when I was in high school and centered around the type of school I attended. So in case you weren't aware, it's very common in agricultural communities to have what are known as farmer schools. That's not a technical term, but more just something easy to define them. The schools are generally organized by the local farmers, and while you still study the various courses needed to get into college, you also study farming technology courses and get credit hours for work study working on one or more farms. The area I lived in was surrounded by a number of large farms which grew cotton primarily. So during the year, we'd spend time out in the field both tilling, planting, and harvesting. One of the farms near the school was this thousand acre spread that like the others grew mostly cotton, though sometimes they rotated to soybeans or silage, basically corn, but you don't harvest it. This farm had a long partnership with the school so the students provided near free labor for the farmer. The farmer leased this property from some out-of-state owner and paid them a portion of the revenue from the harvest. Imagine my surprise then when I and many of my classmates arrived at the farm to do our work study and the farmer instructed some to crew the sprayers and start spraying herbicide on the fields, while others, myself included, were to take tractors and discs and plow everything under. The farmer wanted every square inch of the fields returned to just dirt. We were shocked, to say the least. But after some discussion, we set to work. It took us the better part of a weekend to do so, 
and when we were done, the field was in a beautiful, if barren, state. The farmer thanked each of us personally and paid us about $500 each, quite the sum for a 90s high school senior. We returned to the school, told our headmaster that the contract was completed, and he informed us that the farmer would no longer be working with the school, and we'd been sent to one of the other larger farms for the rest of the year and our work study. It was probably two or three months later before word started going around about why we'd been instructed to destroy the crop. Granted, these were just rumors, but based on how things turned out for the farmer, I suspect there's some truth to it. So apparently the landowner had decided that he was not going to renew the lease the farmer had on the land. This lease renewal just so happened to fall a few weeks before harvest season would start. Given that the average cotton farm earns about $1,500 per acre, a thousand acre farm would easily net the owner $1.5 million, about 500,000 of that being pure profit. I don't know what the farmer's lease was, but it stands to reason that it wasn't anywhere near that. So this landowner had figured out a neat little trick, let the farmer get a good crop planted and then refuse to renew the lease. The farmer would leave the plants in the field and the landowner would just need to pay some contractors to come harvest it and they'd earn a profit. Since at the time the farmer's lease wasn't up yet, he decided to prevent that from happening. His act of revenge against the owner was to prevent them from cashing in on their hard work. Sure, it destroyed his farm, and he had to sell off most everything he owned to buy some property for himself, but he'd proved a point. The owner did try to sue the farmer, though he, the owner, really didn't have a leg to stand on, or so I was told. I think the court ruled that since the farmer was still under the lease when he had the land tilled under, that it was his property to do with as he wished, and thus, the landowner couldn't tell him what to do with his property. I learned a rather valuable lesson from that man, beyond what I learned about farming. That lesson was, never ever cross someone with nothing to lose. Now, I don't know all that much about farming myself, so I was kinda glad to see that OP added a little bit of an edit onto the bottom. It says, since it was brought up in the comments, let me add some details here. Cotton is one of the few crops which leave a negative nutrient value in the soil meaning that after harvest, even if you till the dead plants under, or even if you till them prior to harvest, you won't have as much nutrients as you started with. That's why farmers will plant another crop, usually winter wheat, in place, and then till it under rather than harvesting it. This is something commonly called a green manure, but it works to put nutrients that the cotton pulled out of the soil back into it. While the ground wouldn't have been completely dead or sterile, any crop planted on that tract of land without further treatment of the soil wouldn't have produced the same acre per acre yield that a comparable crop would have had he gone to harvest and planted the secondary crop. Which means that the landowner would either have to plant the green manure and spend money that way or pay by the ton to use artificial fertilizer. Okay, okay, so I went to the comment section on this one and it didn't disappoint. We've got to go through this one with you. It's a comment trail of gold starting with, reap what you sow. There's no cash left with no till. This has been very informative. Even tractors were angry. You could tell that from their furrowed plows. I'm finding this thread quite irrigating. You could say his plans were soiled. You could say the farmer was intractable. Going a bit further down in the comments, I actually learned a little bit about farming from OP. There was a question asked of OP that says, was there nothing to harvest that could have been sold as premature crop? Harvest and haul everything the week before the lease is up? OP replied with, Cotton doesn't work that way. With cotton, typically, you let it go to bud, and then, when the buds open to reveal the fibers, you spray a defoliant on the field to kill the plant. You let it stay in the field a couple weeks, mostly till it's dried out, and then harvest it. You don't do a staged harvest like with some crops. For example, with corn, you have two basic harvest methods. If the crop is still green, you can harvest it for silage, silage being a kind of animal feed. In that case, you cut up the entire plant, stalk and all, and harvest that way. If you wait till it dries out and dies, you harvest instead for grain. Note, the reason you spray to kill the plant is so it doesn't drop the buds. If you didn't do this, the crop would simply fall off the plant and you'd be back to square one. This next story comes to us from Saida Majet. Using my parking space? All good, you will be using it forever. Let's jump right in. 
So I'm living in Japan now and here people ride bicycles a lot. You can't leave your bike anywhere and you have to pay for parking. Between one and two dollars per day. There are very few free parking areas for bicycles. Most people leave their bikes at the same place, so they pay monthly because it's cheaper and you have your own space. This started a couple of weeks ago. Someone in my building started having a guest who decided to steal my bicycle parking space whenever they came to visit. Sometimes they stayed the whole night, so I had to go to the station, pay $1, and come all the way home walking, which meant I would need to walk to the station the next day, getting up earlier, walk like 20 minutes to the station while carrying my heavy bag. All the bicycle spaces have a number, which means they are reserved for someone. Mine is the 105, but this effort decided to take mine whenever they came to visit. The second time this happened, I told the building manager, but they didn't do anything. The third time, I saw the bicycle there. It was the same red expensive bicycle. I left a note in Japanese saying, please don't leave your bicycle here. This is my space and I am using it every day. I found the note taped with the tape I used to tape it on their bike to my parking space and it had a couple of bad words in Japanese at the end. Basically, he was not only stealing my space, but making fun of me by insulting me. Fine. It's just fine. I probably wouldn't have done anything about it if he hadn't written those words. This triggered me and got the worst in me. This person did it again a couple of times, so I knew this would continue. I was thinking about buying another bicycle, a better, more expensive one I could use to go on cycling trips, so a good chain and lock was needed anyway. I bought one of the thickest they had at the store and decided to try its efficiency. I locked his bicycle next time I saw it there. It hasn't moved for the last seven days. There were two notes. The first one was a very aggressive one with more bad words and threats about going to the police, which I don't care. Let's go that way, buddy. Second note days later was an apology and they begged for me to unlock the bike because they tried to break it, but they couldn't. I guess he has learned his lesson. I'm pretty sure he won't do it again, but I just want to enjoy this feeling of victory a couple more days. I will free it in two to three days, I guess. Now, OP clarified a couple of things at the end with an edit. It says, thank you very much for the awards, the support, and all the comments. You guys are amazing. In order to keep my name out of any legal issues, I changed parking lots. It is not as close as this one, but I could come back in a month or two, and I would be getting a new space, so it would be okay. I left a tiny and very discreet note saying I will free his bicycle in exchange for $100. I wanted to ask for more, but probably he wouldn't pay it. I wrote, tape the bill under the seat. I will wait a couple of weeks and if he doesn't pay, I will take it out at night as far as possible from the place, steal his seat, cut the brakes and tires, and all the other small pieces I can get or destroy. I can't steal the bike and dump her somewhere else because he locked it so I would need to carry it. The lock I got is the thickest and one of the most expensive in the bicycle shop. You can't cut it with the normal tools because the thing is as thick as my finger. I'm pretty sure you need some kind of industrial tool to cut it. It would be easier to cut the parking device because the metal is thinner there. I think in this case, I would just leave the lock on the bike and request a new spot from the management. Literally just need to report to them that somebody's been in your spot and you need a new one, and then the management can deal with the removal of that bike. I'm guessing the fee to get it back from the management would be a lot more than what you're wanting to charge that person. Plus, you'd get to see them sweat it out a little bit longer while their bike's stuck there and they can't do anything about it. This next story comes to us from X Attention. Oh, oh, nope, we'll leave it at that. Neighbor yelled at my mom with cancer. I got his car towed. Let's jump right in. Just so this story makes more sense, I live in a smallish gated community, and me and my neighbor's house are in the corner of the community, and our garages face each other, so we can't pull out at the same time, etc., because it's a tight space. Our direct neighbors consist of a couple and their kids. The wife is nice enough, the kids are okay. But the husband, recently found out he's now ex-husband, is a total butthole. We'll call him Sam for the purpose of the story. We and the community HOA has had multiple previous issues with Sam. First was the night that he was in the house screaming obscenities at the top of his lungs to his wife in the garage. The cops were called but nothing happened. The second was him illegally dumping a mattress outside our gate, 
which he was recorded doing on various ring doorbell cameras and reprimanded. And then there was the incident with my mom. My mom, who had cancer at the time, was headed to an appointment and she opened the garage to leave and Sam's big truck was parked outside of his open garage, therefore blocking my mom from leaving. He was nowhere to be found. My mom sat patiently waiting for 15 minutes before honking her horn. Not even 30 seconds later, he emerges from his house and stands behind my mom's car, angrily screaming that my mom is a bee, and he knows we reported him for the mattress, which we didn't, and yelling F you, etc. at the top of his lungs, waving his arms in the air like an idiot. Finally, he gets in his truck and whips it around so my mom can leave, now late for the appointment. That's when we knew Sam was a complete butt. After the incident, we noticed more often that he would just park his truck in front of his garage, again therefore blocking ours, and would disappear for 30 to 40 minutes. The final straw happened last week. I'm at work and get a ring doorbell notification that my mom is entering through the front door, which was weird because that means she didn't park in the garage, she parked in one of the parking spots in the neighborhood. Yes, there are other public spots in the neighborhood that Sam could have been parking in. And in the background of the camera, I can see Sam's dumb truck once again blocking our garage. 30 minutes go by and it's still there and I'm fed up. I screenshot the video feed and send it to a member of the HOA and send a message outlining how this has been happening for months, blah blah, he screamed at my mom. And what did they do? Called a tow truck. F you, Sam. I've towed my fair share of cars that were parked in places where they shouldn't be. One thing you'll learn very quickly though, is that if you have a problem with somebody, call the tow truck a lot earlier. There's no point in having it happen for months. If they're blocking your garage, you have a right to get out. Call the tow truck, have them impound the car or truck, whatever's in your way, and then they're going to have to pay a lot of money to get it out. This next story comes to us from Top Desert Ace. Thank you, Donatius, for reminding me of this fun story of revenge. Let's jump right in. I'm at work on break browsing Pro Revenge while I wait for the next plane to come in. I'm literally just a gas station attendant for aircraft. And I was reminded of a funny story while reading Donatius' Locker Thief story. Obligatory not my story, I was barely involved. Info leading up to the revenge. So, back a while at my other job at an animal shelter, myself and a couple co-workers were talking and one coworker mentioned that her son's car kept getting messed up in the student parking lot at the high school. So I asked why, and she said that apparently another student has it in his head that one particular spot in the student parking lot is his, despite there never having been assigned parking at that school. Now, this kid, who I'll call Little Crap, has a tow truck. Not even one of those big flatbed trucks, it's a crappy little beater pickup with a tow hook in the back. If you've seen the movie Cars, think slightly bigger than Mater. Anyways, whenever someone parks in a little crap spot, he then tows that person's car out and parks in the aforementioned spot, usually damaging the vehicle in the process. Well, while my coworker was telling us this, I said, you know what would be funny? Parking the Bearcat in that spot and weighing it down. It'd be effing hilarious to see that little crap try and tow that big chungus of a vehicle. The chief of police was chatting with us. The animal shelter in my hometown is considered part of the police department and officers will occasionally visit us every once in a while. And he laughed and said, I would love to see that. The revenge. So to start, the state I live in, according to the laws, moving a vehicle a certain distance without the owner's consent and without proper towing permits is considered vehicle theft. I was told this story a few days later, so here's how it went down. The police chief placed a bait truck in the parking spot and set up a couple undercover units close by, and the truck itself was weighed down with a crap load of cement bags. My coworker said she was surprised the truck didn't collapse under the weight. Sure as crap, little crap shows up, sees the truck in his spot, and attempts to tow it away. Now, the plan was for the undercovers to come out and arrest him right then and there, what happened was that Little Crap did a burnout trying to move the truck. He was successful for a few feet, at least the bare minimum for a misdemeanor, and then the back axle popped out of the tow truck. The undercovers came out and arrested Little Crap. The camera footage was obtained, which showed the roughly 100 other times he's done this, which of course only bumped up his charges. 
Now, I have to admit, I didn't know what a Bearcat was, so I looked it up, and apparently it's an armored vehicle that some police stations use. Now, OP was asked in the comment section down below, why does your hometown PD need a Bearcat? And OP replied, sometimes crap happens. I thank you for watching, have a wonderful day, and we'll see you tomorrow.